Moll Flanders by Daniel Defoe Read by Alex Kingston The first account that I can recollect or could ever learn of myself was that I wandered among a crew of those people they call gypsies or Egyptians. My mother had been convicted of felony for a certain petty theft. She pleaded her belly and being found quick with child, was respited for seven months, in which time, having brought me into the world, she obtained the favour of being transported to the plantations. She left me about half a year old, and in bad hands, you may be sure. Compassion moved the magistrates of the town to order some care to be taken of me. It was my good hap to be put to nurse to a woman who was indeed poor, but had been in better circumstances. The woman also had a little school, which she kept to teach children to read and to work. I continued here till I was eight years old, when I was terrified with news that the magistrates had ordered that I should go to service. I was able to do but little service wherever I was to go, except to run errands and to be drudged to some cook-maid. I told my nurse, as we called her, that I believed I could get my living without going into service, if she pleased to let me, for she had taught me to work with my needle and spin worsted, which is the chief trade of that city. I told her that if she would keep me, I would work very hard for her. I did nothing but work and cry all day, which grieved the good kind woman so much that at last she began to be concerned for me, for she loved me very well. My good motherly nurse resolved that I should not go to service yet. She bade me not to cry, and she said she would speak to Mr. Mayor, and I should not go to service until I was bigger. This pacified me for the present. I gave all my money to my mistress nurse, as I called her, and told her she should have all I got for myself when I was a gentlewoman. By this, and some other of my talk, my old tutoress began to understand what I meant by being a gentlewoman. I was now about ten years old, mighty grave and humble, very mannerly. At last I was called upon by the magistrates to go out to service, but I was come to be so good a workman myself, and the ladies were so kind to me, that it was plain I could maintain myself. My nurse told them that she would keep the gentlewoman, as she called me, to be her assistant and teach the children, which I was very well able to do, though I was yet very young. As I grew up, the ladies of the town brought me work to do for them, and not only paid me for doing it, but taught me how, so that now I was a gentlewoman indeed, as I understood that word. By that time I was twelve years old, I not only found myself clothes and paid my nurse for my keeping, but got money in my pocket too beforehand. At last, one of the ladies took so much fancy to me that she would have me home to her house for a month to be among her daughters. My good woman said to her that unless she resolved to keep me forever, she would do the little gentlewoman more harm than good. That's true, says the lady. Therefore, I'll only take her for a week, so that I may see how my daughters and she agree together, and how I like her temper. This was prudently managed enough. I was so pleased there, and they with me, that I had enough to do to come away, and they were as unwilling to part with me. About the time I was fourteen years and a quarter old, my good old nurse, mother, I ought to call her, fell sick and died. The parish children she kept were immediately removed by the church wardens. The school was at an end, and the children of it had to stay at home until they were sent somewhere else. As for what she left, her married daughter with six or seven children came and swept it away at once. Some of the neighbours who had known my circumstances took so much compassion of me as to acquaint the lady in whose family I had been a week. Immediately she sent her maid to fetch me away, so I went with them, bag and baggage, and with a glad heart. Here I continued until I was between seventeen and eighteen years old, with all the advantages of education that could be imagined. 
The lady in the house where I was had two sons, young gentlemen of very promising parts and of extraordinary behaviour. It was my misfortune to be very well with them both, but they managed themselves with me in quite a different manner. The eldest began with that unhappy snare to all women, taking notice upon all occasions how pretty I was, how agreeable, how well carriaged, and the like. This he contrived so subtly, for he would contrive to be talking to his sisters, when though I was not yet by, he knew I was not so far off, but that I should be sure to hear him. He would talk softlier, as if he had not known it, then, as if he had forgot himself, would speak loud again. One day, going by his sister's chamber, where I was there doing something about dressing her, he comes in with an air of gaiety. Oh, said he to me, how do you do, Mrs. Betty? Don't your cheeks burn, Mrs. Betty? I made a curtsy and blushed, but said nothing. What makes you talk so, brother? said the lady. Why, says he, we have been talking of her below stairs this half hour. You can say no harm of her, that I am sure, so it is no matter what you have been talking about. A great many fine things have been said about Mrs. Betty, I assure you, particularly that she is the handsomest young woman in Colchester. In short, they begin to toast her health in the town. I wonder at you, brother, says the sister. Betty wants but one thing, for nothing but money now recommends a woman. The men play the game all into their own hands. Her younger brother, who was close by, cried, Hold, sister, you run too fast. I am an exception to your rule, I assure you. If I find a woman so accomplished as you talk of, I assure you I would not trouble myself about the money. Take care not to fancy one, then, without the money. I thought it was time for me to withdraw, and I did so, but not so far that I heard not all their discourse. One day the elder brother came running upstairs towards the room where his sisters used to sit and work as he often used to do, calling to them before he came in, as was his way too. I, being there alone, stepped to the door and said, Sir, the ladies are not here. As I stepped forward to say this, he was just got to the door, and clasping me in his arms, as if it had been by chance, Oh, Mrs. Betty, says he, are you here? That's better still. I want to speak with you more than I do with them. Then, having me in his arms, he kissed me three or four times. I struggled to get away, and yet did it but faintly neither. He held me fast and still kissed me till he was almost out of breath, then sitting down says, Dear Betty, I am in love with you. His words, I must confess, fired my blood. He repeated it afterwards several times that he was in love with me. Nothing else passed at that time. When he was gone, I soon recovered myself again. I had my head full of pride, but knowing nothing of the wickedness of the times, I had not one thought of my own safety or of my virtue. Had my young master offered it at first sight, he might have taken any liberty he thought fit with me. But he did not see his advantage, which was my happiness for that time. After this attack, it was not long but he found an opportunity to catch me again. The brother had so well watched me, he knew where I was. Seeing me at work, he comes into the room to me directly. He began just as he did before, with taking me in his arms and kissing me for almost quarter of an hour. By and by, he threw me down upon the bed and kissed me there most violently. After this, he thought he heard somebody come upstairs, and so he got off from the bed, lifted me up, professing a great deal of love for me, but told me it was all an honest affection, and that he meant no ill to me. With that, he put five guineas into my hand and went away downstairs. I was more confounded with the money than I was before with the love. I began to be so elevated 
but I scarce knew the ground I stood on. If a woman once thinks herself handsome, she never doubts the truth of any man that tells her he is in love with her. He comes up again in half an hour, or thereabouts, and falls to work with me again as before, only with a little less introduction. I was still on fire with his first visit, and said very little. He did, as it were, put words into my mouth, telling me how passionately he loved me, and that though he could not mention such a thing till he came to his estate, he was resolved to make me happy then, and himself too, that is to say, to marry me. We had not sat long, but he got up, stopping my very breath with kisses. He threw me upon the bed again. Then, being both well warmed, he went farther with me than decency permits me to mention, nor had it been in my power to have denied him at that moment, had he offered me much more than he did. Though he took these freedoms with me, it did not go to what they called the last favour, which, to do him justice, he did not attempt. He put almost a handful of gold in my hand and left me, making a thousand protestations of his passion for me and of his loving me above all the women in the world. Thus, I gave up myself to a readiness of being ruined without the least concern. I am a fair memento to all young women whose vanity prevails over their virtue. In short, if he had known how easy the trifle he aimed at was to be had, he would have troubled his head no farther, but he would have given me four or five guineas, and have lain with me the next time he had come at me, and if I had known his thoughts, and how hard he thought I would be to be gained, I might have made my own terms with him. If I had not capitulated for an immediate marriage, I might, for a maintenance, till marriage, and might have had what I would, for he was already rich to excess, besides what he had in expectation. But I seemed wholly to have abandoned all such thoughts as these, and was taken up only with the pride of my beauty, and of being beloved by such a gentleman as for the gold. In the meantime, however, I was cunning enough not to give the least cause to any in the family to suspect me. One evening I was in the garden with his two younger sisters and himself, all very innocently merry, when he found means to convey a note into my hand, by which he directed me to understand that he would tomorrow desire me publicly to go of an errand for him into the town, and that I should see him somewhere by the way. After dinner, he very gravely says to me, his sisters being all by, Mrs. Betty, I must ask a favour of you. When he had given me my errands, he told his sisters a very long story of a visit he was going to make to a family they all knew. He very formally asks his sisters to go with him, and they, as formally, excused themselves, because of company that they had noticed was to come and visit them that afternoon which, by the way, he had contrived on purpose. He finds an opportunity to say very softly to me, Come away, my dear, as soon as ever you can. I said nothing, but made a curtsy as if I had done so to what he had said in public. In about quarter of an hour I went out too. I had no dress other than I had before, except that I had a hood, a mask, a fan and a pair of gloves in my pocket, so that there was not the least suspicion in the house. He waited for me in a coach in the back lane, which he knew I must pass by. He had directed the coachman to go to Mile End, where lived a confidant of his, where was all the convenience in the world to be as wicked as we pleased. I told him I had no reason to question the sincerity of his love to me after so many protestations, but, and there I stopped, as if I left him to guess the rest. But what, my dear, says he, I guess what you mean is what if you should be with child. Is that not it? Why then, says he, I'll take care of you and provide for you, and the child too, and that you may see I'm not in jest, here's an earnest for you. 
With that, he pulls out a silk purse with a hundred guineas in it and gave it to me. And I'll give you such another, says he, every year till I marry you. Putting my purse into my bosom, I made no more resistance to him, but let him do just what he pleased, and as often as he pleased. I went back to the town, did the business he publicly directed me to do, and was at home before anybody thought me long. As for my gentleman, he stayed out, as he told me he would, till late at night, and there was not the least suspicion in the family, either on his account or mine. We had, after this, frequent opportunities to repeat our crime, chiefly by his contrivance, especially at home, when his mother and the young ladies went abroad a-visiting. We took our fill of our wicked pleasure for nearly half a year, and yet, which was the most to my satisfaction, I was not with child. Before this half-year was expired, his younger brother falls to work with me. Finding me alone in the garden one evening, he begins a story of the same kind to me. I resisted the proposal with obstinacy and began to arm myself with arguments. I laid before him the inequality of the match, the treatment I should meet within the family, the ingratitude it would be to his good father and mother who had taken me into their house upon such generous principles. In short, I said everything to dissuade him from his design that I could imagine, except telling him the truth. This young gentleman was plain and honest, so he pretended to nothing with me. Knowing his own innocence, he was not so careful to make his having a kindness for Mrs. Betty a secret in the house as his brother was. He said enough to let his sisters perceive he loved me. His mother saw too, which, though they took no notice of it to me, they did to him, and immediately I found their carriage to me altered more than ever before. At last I got information among the servants that I should, in a very little while, be desired to remove without any pretenses for it. After some time, the younger gentleman took an opportunity to tell me that the kindness he had for me had got vent in the family. He told me his plain way of talking had been the occasion of it. The reason was that he was at a point that if I would consent to have him, he would tell them all openly that he intended to marry me. I had nothing to do but to give him my hand. He would answer for all the rest. I repented heartily my easiness with the eldest brother, not from any reflection of conscience, but from a view of the happiness I might have enjoyed and had now made impossible. I could not think of being a whore to one brother and a wife to the other. Then it came into my thoughts that the first brother had promised to make me his wife when he came to his estate, but had never spoken a word of having me for a wife after he had conquered me for a mistress. I knew not what to do. The younger brother not only laid close siege to me, but suffered it to be seen. He would come into his sister's room and his mother's room and whisper a thousand kind things to me, even before their faces. This grew so public that the whole house talked of it, and his mother reproved him for it. His mother let fall some speeches, as if she intended to turn me out of doors. I was so sure this could not be a secret to his brother, only that he might not think, as indeed nobody else yet did, that the youngest brother had made any proposal to me about it. Upon serious consideration, I resolved to tell of it first. It was not long before I had an opportunity. The very next day, his brother went to London upon some business, and he came according to his custom to spend an hour or two with me. He easily perceived there was an alteration in my countenance, and that I had been a-crying. He asked me, in very kind terms, what was the matter. After suffering many importunities to draw that out of me, which I longed as much as possible to disclose, I told him that I was afraid the ladies had got some secret information of our correspondence, for it was easy to see that their conduct was very much changed towards me. He said 
that he was sure our correspondence had been managed with so much address that not one creature in the family had so much as a suspicion of it. They are uneasy about you, that is true, says he. But that they have the least suspicion of the case as it respects you and I is so far from being true that they suspect my brother Robin. In short, they are fully persuaded that he makes love to you. The fool has put it into their heads too himself, for he is continually bantering them about it. This gives me the assurance that they do not suspect me in the least. I hope this will be to your satisfaction too. So it is, says I, one way. I then related the whole affair to him. I told him how imprudently his brother had managed himself in making himself so public. I told him how far I had resisted him, how sincere and honourable his offers were. But, says I, my case will be doubly hard, for as they carry it ill to me now because he desires to have me, they'll carry it worse when they find I have denied him. Then it comes that I am married already to somebody else, or I would never refuse such a match so above me as this was. He desired I would not give my consent to his brother, nor yet give him a flat denial, but that I would hold him in suspense for a while. I told him he knew very well I had no consent to give, that he had engaged himself to marry me, that he had all along told me I was his wife, and I looked upon myself as effectually so. He pacified me as well as he could, but though he was very kind to me, and kissed me a thousand times, and more, I believe, and gave me money too. He offered no more all the while we were together, which was above two hours. His brother did not come from London for five or six days. It was two days more before he got an opportunity to talk close with him about it. I will be free with you, says Robin. I do love the girl above all the women in the world, and I will have her. Let the others say and do what they will. I believe the girl will not deny me. When he told me this, though it was most rational to think I would not deny him, I knew in my conscience I must do so. So I interrupted him. I, said I, does he think I cannot deny him? He shall find I can for all that. My dear, says he, I have been considering very much upon it, you may be sure, and though it is a piece of advice that has a great many mortifications in it for me, I see no better way for you than to let him go on. If you find him in earnest, marry him. Turning pale as death, I was at the very point of sinking down out of my chair. My dear, says he, what's the matter with you? I was not able to speak for several minutes more. Recovered, he began again. My dear, says he, what made you so surprised at what I said? You may see plainly how the family stand in this case. They would be stark mad if it was my case, as it is my brother's. And for aught I see, it would be my ruin, and yours too. I, says I, still speaking angrily, are all your protestations and vows to be shaken by the dislike of your family? Is this your faith and honour, your love, and the solidity of your promises? My dear, I have not broken one promise with you. I did tell you I would marry you when I was to come to my estate. But my father is a hale, healthy man, and may live thirty years still. And you never proposed my marrying you sooner. As to the rest, I have not failed you in anything. You have wanted for nothing. I could not deny a word of this. Why then can you persuade me to such a horrid step as leaving you, since you have not left me? Will you allow no affection, no love on my side, where there has been so much on yours? Have I made you no returns? Are the sacrifices I have made of honour and modesty no proof of my being tied to you in bonds too strong to be broken? But here, my dear, says he, the remembrance of what we have done may be wrapped up in an eternal silence, as if it had never happened. You shall always have my respect, 
my sincere affection. Only then shall it be honest and perfectly just to my brother. You shall be, my dear sister, as now you are, my dear... And there he stopped. Your dear whore, says I, you would have said it if you had gone on, and you might as well have said it. However, I desire you to remember the many hours' pains you have taken to persuade me to believe that I was your wife intentionally, though not in the eye of the world, and that it was as effectual a marriage that had passed between us as if we had been publicly wedded by the parson of the parish. He stood stock still for a while and said nothing. You cannot, says I, without the highest injustice, believe that I yielded upon all these persuasions without a love, not to be shaken again by anything that could happen afterward. If I have been persuaded to believe that I am really in the essence of the thing, your wife, shall I now give the lie to all those arguments and call myself your whore or mistress? And will you transfer me to your brother? Can you bid me cease loving you and bid me love him? No, sir. It is impossible. I will ever be true, and had much rather, since it has come to that unhappy length, be your whore than your brother's wife. He appeared pleased, and touched with the impression of this last discourse, and told me he stood where he did before, and had not been unfaithful to me in any one promise he had ever made. He thought this would not be an entire parting to us, but that we might love as friends all our days. He had but one question to ask of me, and if that question was answered in the negative, he could but think still it was the only step I could take. I guessed at his question presently, namely whether I was sure I was not with child. I told him he need not be concerned about it, for I was not. Why then, my dear, says he, I cannot but be of the opinion that it will be the best course you can take. With this, he took his leave. He left me in the utmost confusion of thought. It was but Tuesday evening when we talked, but he had no opportunity to come to me until the Sunday after. Now he had me an hour and a half again by myself. I asked him warmly what opinion he must have of my modesty, that he could suppose I should so much as entertain a thought of lying with two brothers. He seemed surprised at my obstinacy told me that he did not see any other way to save us both from ruin, and that if he must say no more of it to me, he added with unusual coldness that he did not know anything else we had to talk of. When he came to give me a parting kiss, I burst out into such a passion of crying that though I would have spoke, I could not, and only pressing his hand seemed to give him the adieu, but cried vehemently. He was sensibly moved with this, and said a great many kind things to me to abate the excess of my passion, all the while insisting that if I did refuse, he would notwithstanding provide for me, but decline me in the main point, even as a mistress, making it a point of honour not to lie with the woman that for aught he knew might come to be his brother's wife. These things oppressed my mind, that I was reduced very low indeed. I was distressed to see him so, and also was he to see me, for he really loved me most passionately. After the end of five weeks I grew better, but was so weak, so altered, so melancholy, and recovered so slowly, that the physicians apprehended I should go into a consumption, that something troubled me, and in short, that I was in love. Upon this the whole house was set upon to examine me. As I well might, I denied my being in love at all. It was not many weeks after this before I was about the house again, but I continued melancholy, silent, dull, and retired, which amazed the whole family, except he that knew the reason for it. At last I broke the way myself in the family for my removing, being talking seriously with the old lady one day about my circumstances in the world. The old lady said, I am afraid, Betty, my son has had some influence upon you, 
and that you are melancholy on his account. Pray, will you let me know how the matter stands with you both? Why, truly, madam, said I, that matter stands as I wish it did not. I shall be very sincere with you in it, whatever befalls me for it. Mr. Robin has several times proposed marriage to me, but I have always resisted him, and that perhaps in terms more positive than became me, considering the regard that I ought to have for every branch of your family. I have positively told him that I would never entertain a thought of that kind unless I had your consent, and his father's also. Then, Mrs. Betty, says the old lady, you have been much juster to us than we have been to you, for we have all looked upon you as a kind of snare to my son. Away goes the old lady to her daughters, and tells them the whole story. They were surprised at it, as I believed they would be. One said she could never have thought it, another that Robin was a fool, a third that she would not believe a word of it, and would warrant that Robin would tell the story another way. The old gentlewoman was resolved to go to the bottom of it with her son immediately. Upon his coming to them, for the mother and her daughters were all still together, I must have some talk with you, Robin, says the old lady. With all my heart, madam, says Robin, looking very merry. I hope it is about a good wife, for I am at a loss in that affair. How can that be, says his mother? Did you not say you resolved to have Mrs. Betty? Aye, madam, but there is one has forbid the bands, Mrs. Betty herself. The jade is so stout she won't capitulate nor yield upon any terms except such as I cannot effectually grant. I do not understand. I hope you are not in earnest. Madam, says he, the case is plain enough. She won't have me. Is not that plain enough? You talk of conditions that you cannot grant, says the mother. Does she want a settlement? What fortune does she bring you? As to fortune, says Robin, she is rich enough. I am satisfied in that point, but tis I that am not able to come up to her terms, and she is positive she will not have me without. Here the sisters put in. Madam, says the second sister, tis impossible to be serious with him. He will never give a direct answer to anything. You know how to dispose of her out of his way if you thought there was anything in it. Robin was a little warmed by his sister's rudeness, but he was even with her, yet with good manners. There are two sorts of people, madam, says he, turning to his mother, that there is no contending with. There is a wise body and a fool. Tis a little hard I should engage with both of them together. The younger sister then put in, we must be fools indeed, in my brother's opinion, that he should think we can believe he has seriously asked Mrs. Betty to marry him, and she has refused him. When your brother had said to your mother that he had asked her no less than five times, and that it was so, that she positively denied him, methinks a younger sister need not question the truth of it when her mother did not. Well, son, says the old lady, what are these hard conditions? Yes, madam, says Robin. I had done it before now, if the teasers here had not worried me by way of interruption. The conditions are that I bring my father and you to consent to it. Without that, she protests she will never see me more upon that head. The mother said with some passion, I had heard this before, but I could not believe it. If it is so, Mrs. Betty has acted handsomely indeed, says the eldest sister. I confess says the mother. To give such an answer shows more respect to your father and me than I can tell how to express. I shall value the girl the better for it as long as I know her. But I shall not, says Robin, unless you give your consent. I'll consider of that a while, says the mother. If you had thought as much about making me easy as you have about making me rich, you would soon consent to it. Why, Robin, says the mother again, are you really in earnest? Would you so fain have her as you pretend? I am in earnest, in that I will never have anybody else if I can help it. Betty or nobody else, so you may determine for me. The question which of the two shall be in your breast to decide, madam, provided only that my good-humoured sisters may have no vote in it. 
she advised with the eldest son, and he used all the arguments in the world to persuade her to consent. As to the father, he was a man in a hurry of public affairs and getting money, seldom at home, thoughtful of the main chance, but left all those things to his wife. It was not so difficult or dangerous for the elder brother, who nobody suspected of anything, to have a freer access to me than before. The mother proposed it to him to talk with me. She brought me to him into her own chamber, desired me to be very sincere with him, and left us together. He took me in his arms and kissed me very tenderly, and told me that I should make myself happy or miserable as long as I lived. What has happened between us may be buried and forgotten. I shall always be your sincere friend, without any inclination to nearer intimacy when you become my sister, and we shall have all the honest part of conversation without any reproaches between us of having done amiss. To satisfy you that I am sincere, added he, I here offer you five hundred pounds to make you some amends for the freedoms I have taken with you. At last he told me very plainly that if I refused, he was sorry to add that he could never go on in that station as we stood before. He entreated me to consider seriously of it, assured me that it was the only way to preserve our mutual affection. He took care on all occasions to lay this home to me in the worst colours that it could be possible to be drawn in. On the other hand, he failed not to set forth the easy, prosperous life which I was going to live. As to his promises of marriage, the nature of things had put an end to that by the probability of my becoming his brother's wife. This, and his persuasion at length, prevailed with me to consent, though with much reluctance. I had some little apprehensions about me too, lest my new spouse, who by the way I had not the least affection for, should be skilful enough to challenge me on another account upon our first coming to bed together. Whether he did it by design or not, I know not but his elder brother took care to make him very much fuddled before he went to bed, so that I had the satisfaction of a drunken bedfellow the first night. He contrived it so that his brother might be able to make no judgment of the difference between a maid and a married woman. At the end of five years, he died. I had two children by him. He had been really a very good husband to me, and we lived very agreeably together. My circumstances were not great, nor was I much mended by the match. Indeed, I had preserved the elder brother's bonds to me to pay me five hundred pounds which he offered me for my consent to marry his brother. This, with what I had saved of the money he formerly gave me, and about as much more by my husband, left me a widow with about twelve hundred pounds. My two children were taken happily off my hands by my husband's father and mother, and that was all they got from Mrs. Betty. I confess I was not suitably affected with the loss of my husband, nor can I say that I ever loved him as I ought to have done, or was as proportionable to the good usage I had from him. He was a tender, kind, good-humoured man as any woman could desire. However, I was never in bed with my husband, but I wished myself in the arms of his brother. And though his brother never offered me the least kindness that way, after our marriage, but carried it just as a brother ought to, it was impossible for me to do so to him. In short, I committed adultery and incest with him every day in my desires, which without doubt was as effectually criminal in the nature of the guilt as if I had actually done it. Before my husband died, his elder brother was married. I was now left loose on the world. Being still young and handsome, as everybody said of me, and I assure you I thought myself so, and with a tolerable fortune in my pocket, I was courted by several very tolerable tradesmen, particularly very warmly by one, a linen draper, at whose house after my husband's death I took a lodging, his sister being my acquaintance. She brought me into a world of wild company, and even brought home several persons she liked well enough to see her pretty widow, as she was pleased to call me. 
I had an abundance of admirers, and such as called themselves lovers, but I found not one fair proposal among them all. I had been tricked once by that cheat called love, but I was resolved now to be well married or nothing at all. I was not averse to a tradesman, but I would have one, forsooth, that was something of a gentleman, too. At last I found this amphibious creature, this land-water thing called a gentleman tradesman, and as just plague upon my folly, I was catched in the very snare I laid for myself. This was a draper, too, for though my comrade would have brought me to a bargain with her brother, when it came to the point, it was, it seems, for a mistress, not a wife, and I kept true to this notion that a woman should never be kept for a mistress that had money to keep herself. As it proved, I had much better have been sold by my she-comrade to her brother than have sold myself, as I did, to a tradesman that was a rake, gentleman, shopkeeper, and beggar all together. I was hurried on, by my fancy to a gentleman, to ruin myself in the grossest manner that ever woman did. My new husband, coming to a lump of money at once, fell into such a profusion of expense that all I had, and all he had before, if he had anything worth mentioning, would have not held it out above one year. He was very fond of me for about a quarter of a year. What I got by that was the pleasure of seeing a great deal of my money spent upon myself. As I may say, he had some of the spending of it, too. Come, my dear, says he to me one day. Shall we go and take a turn into the country for about a week? How, says I, shall we go? I am no horsewoman, and tis too far for a coach. No place is too far for a coach and six. You shall travel like a duchess. My dear, tis a frolic. But if you have a mind to it, I don't care. The time was appointed. We had a rich coach, very good horses, coachman, postillion, and two footmen in very good liveries. The servants all called my husband my lord, and the innkeepers, you may be sure, did the like. I was her honour the countess. We travelled to Oxford, and a very pleasant journey we had. Thus, having lived like quality indeed, we went away for Northampton, and in about twelve days' ramble came home again to the tune of around ninety-three pounds. My husband valued nothing of expense. His history has very little weight in it. In about two years and a quarter he broke, and was not so happy to get over into the mint, but got into a sponging house, being arrested in an action too heavy for him to get bail. So he sent for me to come to him. I had been taking care to reserve something for myself, though it was not much. When he sent for me, he told me plainly he had played the fool, and suffered himself to be surprised, which he might have prevented, that now he foresaw he could not stand it. He would therefore have me go home, and in the night take away everything I had in the house of any value, and secure it. After that, he told me that if I could get away with one hundred or two hundred pounds in goods out of the shop, I should do it. Only, says he, let me know nothing of it. I did as he bade, that you may be sure. Having thus taken my leave of him, I never saw him more. He found means to break the bailiff's house that night, or the next, and, having raised what money he could, got over to France. I had one or two letters from him, and no more. In the first, he let me know where he had pawned twenty pieces of fine Holland for thirty pounds, which were really worth above ninety, and enclosed me the token and an order for the taking them up, paying the money, which I did, and made in time above a hundred pounds of them. However, I found my case very much altered, and my fortune much lessened. I could hardly muster up five hundred pounds. Though I had no child, I had one by my gentleman draper, but it was buried. Yet I was a widow bewitched. I had a husband, but no husband. The first thing I did was go by another name. I went into the mint, too, took lodgings in a very private place, dressed myself in the habit of a widow, and called myself Mrs. Flanders. I had made acquaintance with a very sober, good sort of woman. A widow, too, like me, 
but in better circumstances. Finding she agreed with me in just abhorrence of the place and of the company, she invited me to go home with her, telling me that it was ten to one but some good captain of a ship might take fancy to me in that part of the town where she lived. I accepted her offer and was with her half a year and should have been longer, but what she proposed to me happened to herself, and she married very much to her advantage. However, my fortune seemed to be on the wane, and I found nothing present except two or three bosuns. The circumstances I was in made the offer of a good husband the most necessary thing in the world to me. But I soon found that to be made cheap and easy was not the way. It soon began to be found that the widow had no fortune. I began to be dropped in all the discourses of matrimony. Money was now become more valuable than virtue itself. I resolved, therefore, that it was absolutely necessary to change my station and make a new appearance in some other place where I was not known, even to pass by another name if I found occasion. I communicated my thoughts to my intimate friend, the captain's lady, and made no scruple to lay my circumstances open to her. My stock was low, for I had made about fifty pounds at the close of my last affair, and I had about four hundred and sixty pounds left, a great many rich clothes, a gold watch and some jewels, though of no extraordinary value, and about thirty or forty pounds left in linen not disposed of. The captain's wife frequently made me presents as money came into her hands, such as fully amounted to a maintenance, so that I spent none of my own. She told me that if I would be ruled by her, I should certainly get a husband of fortune without leaving him any room to reproach me with want of my own. Her husband and she together invited me most passionately to come to town and be with them. She tells her husband that I had at least fifteen hundred pounds of fortune, and that after some of my relations died, I was like to have a great deal more. It presently went all over the neighbourhood that the young widow had at least fifteen hundred pounds, perhaps a great deal more, and that the captain said so. If the captain was asked at any time about me, he made no scruple to affirm it, though he knew not one word of the matter other than that his wife had told him, so he really believed it to be so. I presently found myself blessed with admirers enough, and I had nothing to do but single out from them the properest man that might be for my purpose, that is to say, the man who was most likely to depend upon the hearsay of a fortune. I picked out my man without much difficulty, but I was to try him to the bottom. First, I pretended on all occasions to doubt his sincerity, and told him perhaps he only courted me for my fortune. He stopped my mouth in that part with the thunder of his protestations, but still I pretended to doubt. He was the best-humoured, merry sort of fellow that I had ever met with. I often reflected on myself how doubly criminal it was to deceive such a man, but that necessity was my authority for it. Though, as he supposed it, I had jested so often about my poverty, when he found it to be true, he had foreclosed all manner of objection. He had declared he took me without any regard to my portion, and whether I was in jest or earnest, I had declared myself to be very poor. Though he might say afterwards he was cheated, he could never say that I had cheated him. However, I hoped he would allow me to ask a few questions which he should answer or not, as he thought fit, and that I would not be offended if he did not answer me at all. One of the questions related to our manner of living, and the place where, because I had heard he had a great plantation in Virginia, and that he had talked of going to live there, for I did not care to be transported. He told me that great part of his estate consisted of three plantations, which brought him in very good income, generally speaking, to the tune of three hundred pounds a year, but that if he was to live upon them would bring him in four times as much. Very well, I thought. You shall carry me thither as soon as you please, though I won't tell you so beforehand. 
I told him I had good reason not to desire to go there to live, because if his plantations were worth so much there, I had not a fortune suitable to a gentleman of twelve hundred pounds a year. He replied generously. He told me that whatever my fortune was, he assured me he would never desire me to go to Virginia with him or go thither himself without me, unless I was perfectly willing. In short, we were married, and very happily so on my side. As to the man, his circumstances were not so good as I had imagined. On the other hand, he had not bettered himself by marrying so much as he expected. I took opportunity one day, soon after we were married, to enter into a short dialogue with him about it. My dear, said I, we have been married a fortnight. Is it not time to let you know whether you have a wife with something or with nothing? I am satisfied that I have the wife I love. I have not troubled you much with my inquiry after it. That's true, I said. But I have a great difficulty upon me about it, which I scarce know how to manage. What's that, my dear? says he. Why, says I, tis a little hard upon me, and tis harder upon you. I have been told that my friend's husband, the captain, has told you that I had a great deal more money than I ever pretended to have. I am sure I never employed him to do so. Well, says he, you never told me what you had, so I have no reason to blame you if you have nothing at all. If you have nothing, tell me plainly and at once, for I can never say you have cheated me. Well, my dear, said I, I am poor, it is true, but not so poor as to have nothing. I pulled out some bank bills and gave him about a hundred and sixty pounds. There's something, my dear, says I, and not quite all, neither. I had brought him so near to expecting nothing that the money, though the sum was small in itself, he owned it was more than he had looked for, and that he did not question by my discourse that my fine clothes, gold watch, and diamond ring or two had been all my fortune. In about a week more I brought him an additional a hundred and eighty pounds, and about sixty pounds in linen, which I made him believe I had been obliged to take with a hundred pounds in gold as a composition for a debt of six hundred pounds, being little more than five shillings in the pound and overvalued too. He was so obliged by the manner and so pleased with the sum, for he had been in a terrible fright lest it had been nothing at all, that he accepted it very thankfully. Thus I got over the fraud of passing for a fortune without money. I took him very plainly one morning, and told him that I was sensible he had been disappointed in a wife. And, to make him amends, I was very willing to go over to Virginia with him, and live there. He said a thousand kind things to me, and that however he was disappointed in his expectations of a fortune, he was not disappointed in a wife, and that this offer was so kind it was more than he could express. He told me that he had a very good house in Virginia, well furnished, that his mother lived in it, and one sister, which was all the relations he had, that as soon as he came his mother would remove to another house which was her own for life, and his after her decease, so that I should have all the house to myself. We put on board the ship which we went in a large quantity of good furniture for our house, with stores of linen and other necessaries, and a good cargo for sale. We arrived in York River, Virginia, and, coming to our plantation, were received with all the demonstrations of tenderness and affection by my husband's mother that were possible to be expressed. We lived here all together, my mother-in-law, at my entreaty, continuing in the house. At first I thought myself the happiest creature alive, when an odd and surprising event put an end to all that felicity in a moment, and rendered my condition the most uncomfortable, most miserable in the world. His mother told me how the greatest part of the inhabitants of the colony came thither in very different circumstances from England, that, generally speaking, they were of two sorts, either, one, 
such as were brought over by masters of ships to be sold as servants. My dear, says she, they are more properly called slaves. Or two, such as are transported from Newgate and other prisons after having been found guilty of felony and other crimes punishable with death. When they come here, says she, we make no difference. The planters buy them, and they work together in the field till their time is out. When it is expired, they have encouragement given them to plant for themselves. Hence, child, says she, many a Newgate bird becomes a great man. We have several justices of the peace, officers of the train bands, and magistrates of the towns they live in that have been burnt in the hand. She told me with a great deal of good-humoured confidence that she was one of the second sort of inhabitants herself. We had frequent discourses of this kind. She told me how she had fallen into very ill company in London in her young days, occasioned by her mother sending her frequently to carry victuals and other relief to a kinswoman of hers who was a prisoner in Newgate. She went on with her story so long and in so particular a manner that I began to be very uneasy. Coming to one particular that required telling her name, she perceived I was out of order and asked me what ailed me. I told her I was so affected with the melancholy story she had told and the terrible things she had gone through that it had overcome me. I begged her to talk no more of it. Why, my dear, says she very kindly, these passages were long before your time. They give me no trouble at all now. I look back on them with a particular satisfaction as they have been a means to bring me to this place. She went on to tell me how she very luckily fell into a good family, where, behaving herself well, and her mistress dying, her master married her, by whom she had my husband and his sister. By her diligence and good management after her husband's death, most of the estate was of her getting, not her husband's, for she had been a widow upward of sixteen year. Let any one judge what must be the anguish of my mind, when I came to reflect that this was certainly no more or less than my own mother. I had now had two children, and was big with another by my own brother, and lay with him still every night. I was now the most unhappy of all women in the world. Had the story never been told me, all had been well. It had been no crime to have lain with my husband, since, as to his being my relation, I had known nothing of it. I did not doubt, but I should talk of it in my sleep, and tell my husband of it whether I would or no. The least thing I could expect then was to lose him, for he was too nice and honest a man to have continued my husband after he had known I was his sister. I resolved that it was absolutely necessary to conceal it all. And thus I lived with the greatest pressure imaginable for three years more, but had no more children. During this time, my mother used to be frequently telling me old stories of her former adventures. I could easily understand that in her younger days she had been both whore and thief, but I verily believe she had lived to repent sincerely of both, and that she was then a very pious, sober, and religious woman. Everything went wrong with us afterwards. My husband grew strangely altered, froward, jealous, and unkind. We came at last to be in such ill terms with one another that I claimed a promise of him, which he entered willingly into with me when I consented to come with him, that I should come away to England again when I pleased, giving him a year's warning to settle his affairs. I insisted so peremptorily upon it that he could not avoid coming to a point either to keep his word with me or to break it. I loathed the thoughts of bedding with him, and used a thousand pretenses of illness and humour to prevent his touching me. At last I put him so out of humour that he took up a rash and fatal resolution. In short, I should not go to England, and though he had promised me, yet it was an unreasonable thing for me to desire it when I considered that he knew nothing of the dreadful circumstances I was in, I could not but confess to myself 
that my proposal was what no wife that had the good of her family at heart would have desired. I never ceased poring upon the means to bring to pass my voyage, and at last proposed going without him. This provoked him to the last degree. He called me not only an unkind wife, but an unnatural mother. As to the charge of unnatural, I could easily answer it to myself, while I knew the whole relation was unnatural in the highest degree in the world. My husband would neither go with me or let me go without him. We had many family quarrels about it, and I strove to do all I could to bring him to a parting with me. At last, I refused to bed with him. He told me he thought I was mad, and if I did not alter my conduct, he would put me under cure. I told him he should find I was far enough from mad, and that it was not in his power or any other villains to murder me. I confess, I was heartily frightened at the thought of his putting me into a madhouse, which would at once have destroyed all possibility of breaking the truth out, for no one would have given credit to a word of it. In the meantime, another quarrel with my husband came up to such an extreme. I told him that as for my going to England, I was resolved on it, come what would. As to treating him not like a husband, I told him that he was neither my lawful husband nor they lawful children. He turned pale as death and stood mute as one thunderstruck. Once or twice I thought he would have fainted. In short, it put him in a fit something like an apoplex. I was forced to fetch something to keep life in him. A little after he was put to bed. The next morning he was as he had been all night, in a violent fever. He recovered, though but slowly. When he came a little better, he told me I had given him a mortal wound with my tongue. I told him I was sorry I had gone so far, to make things worse. This heightened his impatience. Now I found the thing too far gone to conceal it much longer. My husband himself gave me an opportunity to ease myself of the secret. I would explain nothing, unless he would first consent to my going to England. This, he said, he would never do while he lived. On the other hand, I said it was in my power to make him willing when I pleased. This increased his curiosity. At length he tells all this story to his mother and sets her upon me to get the main secret out of me. She used her utmost skill, but I put her to a full stop at once by telling her that the reason and mystery of the whole matter lay in herself. At last, I told her I dared trust her with a secret of the greatest importance, if she would engage solemnly not to acquaint her son with it without my consent. Then I told her my own story and my name, and assured her by such other tokens as she could not deny that I was no more or less than her own child, the same that had saved her from the gallows by being in her belly. My mother's opinion was that I should bury the whole thing entirely and continue to live with him as my husband, till some other event should make the discovery of it more convenient. For child, says she, we are both undone if it comes out. She promised to make me easy in my circumstances as far as she was able, and to leave me what she could at her death, secured for me separately from my husband, so that if it should come out afterwards, I should not be left destitute. I told her that if she should die before the discovery, I should be taken for an impudent creature that had forged such a thing to go away from my husband, or should be counted crazed and distracted, I told her how he had threatened already to put me into a madhouse. I told her that on the most serious reflection I had come to this resolution, which was that she should use her endeavours with her son to give me leave to go to England as I had desired, and to furnish me with a sufficient sum of money, either in goods along with me, or bills of support there, all along suggesting that he might one time or other think it proper to come over to me. That when I was gone, she should then, in cold blood, after obliging him in the solemnest manner to secrecy, discover the case to him, doing it gradually, 
and of her own discretion should guide her, so that he might not be surprised by it, and fly out into any passions and excesses on my account or hers, and that she should concern herself to prevent his slighting the children or marrying again, unless he had a certain account of my being dead. Everything added to make cohabiting with him the most nauseous thing in the world. I think I could almost kind to me. At last, I resolved upon a desperate course and told my mother that I would tell him of it myself. I did not question that we might part by consent and with a good agreement, for I might love him well enough for a brother, though I could not for a husband. All the while he lay at my mother to find out what was the meaning of my expression, that I was not his lawful wife, nor my children his legal children. My mother put him off, told him she could bring me to no explanations, but found there was something that disturbed me very much. He promised her to soften his behaviour, and bid her assure me that he loved me as well as ever. My husband's conduct was immediately altered. Nothing could be kinder and more obliging than he was to me upon all occasions. I could do no less than make some return to it, which I did as well as I could, but nothing was more frightful to me than his caresses and the apprehensions of being with child again by him. We began a new kind of life with one another. Could I have satisfied myself to have gone on with it, I believe it might have continued as long as we had been alive together. One evening, as we were talking very friendly together, he said an abundance of kind things to me relating to the pleasure of our present good agreement and the disorders of our past breach, and what a satisfaction it was to him that we had room to hope we should never have any more of it. I fetched a deep sigh and told him that there was nobody in the world could be more delighted than I was but I was sorry to tell him that there was an unhappy circumstance in our case, which lay too close to my heart, which I knew not how to break to him. He told me I could not be called kind nor faithful to him if I concealed it from him. He then told me that he would importune me no more about it, resolving to acquiesce in whatever I did or said, only begged I would then agree that whatever it was, it should no more interrupt our quiet and our mutual kindness. This was the most provoking thing he could have said, for I wanted his father importunities that I might be prevailed with to bring out that which indeed it was like death to me to conceal. Come, my dear, said I, what conditions will you make with me upon the opening of this affair to you? Any conditions in the world, said he, that you can in reason desire of me. Give it to me under your hand, said I, that if you do not find I am in any fault, or that I am willingly concerned in the causes of the misfortune that is to follow, you will not blame me, use me the worse, do me any injury, or make me be the sufferer for that which is not my fault. That, says he, is the most reasonable demand in the world. He wrote the condition down in the words I had proposed, and signed it with his name. Well, says he, what is next, my dear? That you will not blame me for not discovering the secret of it to you before I knew it. Very just again, says he, with all my heart. So he wrote down that also, and signed it. Well, my dear, says I, then I have but one more condition to make with you, that you shall not discover it to any person in the world except your own mother, that you shall do nothing in a passion, nothing to my prejudice or to your mother's prejudice, without my knowledge and consent. Well, my dear, says I, I'll ask you no more under your hand, but as you are to bear the most unexpected and surprising thing that ever befell any family, I beg you to promise me you will receive it with composure suitable to a man of sense. I'll do my utmost, says he, upon condition you will keep me no longer in suspense, for you terrify me with all these preliminaries. Well then, says I, I must let you know now in calmness and kindness, but with affliction enough, 
that I am your own sister, and that we are both the children of our mother now alive. I saw him turn pale and look wild. I called for a servant and got him a little glass of rum, for he was fainting away. Now, my dear, says I, you will see the reason for my capitulations, and that I neither have been the cause of this matter nor could be so, and that I could know nothing of it before now. I told him particularly how my mother came to discover it to me. I am fully satisfied of that, says he, but tis a dreadful surprise to me. However, I know a remedy for it all that shall put an end to all your difficulties without your going to England. He looked a little disordered when he said this, but I did not apprehend anything from it at that time. My husband was at last prevailed with, and my mother concurring, I obtained a very good cargo for my coming to England. When I parted with my brother, for such I am now to call him, we agreed he should pretend to have an account that I was dead, and so might marry again. He promised to assist and support me as long as I lived. If he died before me, he would leave sufficient to his mother to take care of me, still in the name of a sister. I came away for England in the month of August. Now a new scene of misfortunes attended me. We came just upon the coast of England in two and thirty days, but were then ruffled by two or three storms, one of which drove us away to the coast of Ireland, but arrived at last in Milford Haven. I reached London in about three weeks, where I heard a little while after that our ship was arrived in Bristol, but that by the violent weather she had been in, a great part of her cargo was spoilt. What I brought away with me was indeed considerable. By the help of it I might have married tolerably well. As it was, I was reduced to between two and three hundred pounds in the whole. The looking after of my cargo of goods soon after obliged me to take a journey to Bristol. I took the diversion of going to Bath, for my humour, which was always gay, continued so to an extreme. Here I stayed the whole latter season. I lived pleasantly enough, kept fine company, but found this way of living sunk me exceedingly. I had many melancholy hours at Bath after all the company was gone, but being on good terms with the woman in whose house I lodged in the summer, I found that during the winter I lived rather cheaper there than I could do anywhere else. Having contracted a nearer intimacy with the said woman, I could not help communicating to her the narrowness of my circumstances and loss of my fortune by the damage of my goods by sea. My new friend appeared sensibly affected with my condition, and indeed was so very kind as to reduce the rate of my living with her to so low a price during the summer that she convinced me she got nothing by me. As for lodging during the winter, I paid nothing at all. When the spring season came on, she had some persons of character that frequently lodged in her house. In particular, a gentleman who had singled me out for his companion the winter before. He came down again with another gentleman and two servants and lodged in the same house. He was a complete gentleman and soon understood from me that I was a widow, that I had arrived at Bristol from Virginia and that I waited at Bath till the next Virginia fleet should arrive, by which I expected considerable effects. I understood by him, and others of him, that he had a wife, but that the lady was distempered in her head, and was under the conduct of her own relations, which he consented to. My landlady gave me an advantageous character of him, as a man of honour and of virtue, as well as of great estate. Indeed, I had a great deal of reason to say so of him, too, for though he had frequently come into my chamber when I was in bed, yet he never offered anything to me farther than a kiss, or so much as solicited me to anything till long after. My landlady told me that she thought I ought to expect some gratification from him for my company, 
I told her that I had not given him the least occasion to think I wanted it, could accept of it from him. She told me she would take that part upon her, and managed it dexterously. The first time we were alone together after she had talked to him, he began to inquire a little into my circumstances. I told him that though my cargo of tobacco was damaged, it was not quite lost, and that I hoped with frugal management I should make it hold till more would come, which I expected by the next fleet. It was not long before he attacked me again, assuring me that he inquired merely to assist me. Some weeks passed, and still I never asked him for money, when my landlady, a cunning creature, makes a story of her own inventing and comes in bluntly to me when he and I were together. Oh, widow, says she, I have bad news this morning. The man you sent to Bristol yesterday for money is come back and says he has brought none. I can't imagine why he should say so to you, said I, for I assure you he brought me all the money I sent him for. Here it is, said I pulling out my purse with about twelve guineas in it. I intend you shall have most of it by and by. He seemed distasted a little at her talking as she did at first. The next morning he said he hoped I would not want money and not tell him of it. I told him I had been very much dissatisfied at my landlady's talking so publicly the day before, but I supposed she wanted what I owed her, which I had given her the same night. He was in a mighty good humour that I had paid her. The next morning, having heard me about, he asked me to come into his chamber. He was in bed, and asked me to let him see my purse. I immediately put my hand into my pocket and pulled it out. There was in it three guineas and a half. He asked me if that was all the money I had. Not by a great deal, says I. I went and fetched him a little private drawer, where I had about six guineas more and some silver. I threw it all down upon the bed, and told him that was all my wealth, honesty, to a shilling. He bade me open a little walnut box, and bring him such a drawer, in which there was a great deal of money in gold. Taking my hand, he made me take out as many guineas almost as I could well take up at once. Then he bade me carry it into my own chamber. Not long after this, he began every day to find fault with my clothes, with my laces and headdresses. He pressed me to buy better, which I was willing enough to do, though I did not seem to be so, for I loved nothing in the world better than fine clothes. I told him I must huzzith the money he had lent me, or else I should not be able to pay him again. He then told me that he had not lent me that money, but given it to me. After this he made me take a maid and keep house. He obliged me to die at him, which I did very willingly. We had lived thus for three months when he talked of going away, and fain would have me go to London with him. While this was in debate, he was taken so ill at Shepton that he could not travel. He sent his man back to Bath to beg me to hire a coach and come over to him. He continued very ill of a fever, and kept his bed five weeks, all which time I nursed and tended him as carefully as if I had been his wife. After some time he gathered strength and grew well apace. He took many occasions to express his sense of my tenderness and concern for him. When he grew quite well, he made me a present of fifty guineas for my care, and for hazarding my life to save his. A great while after this I had occasion on my own business to go to Bristol. He hired me a coach and would go with me, and did so. Now indeed our intimacy increased. From Bristol he carried me to Gloucester. Here it was our hap to have no lodging in the inn but one large chamber with two beds in it. The master of the house said very frankly to him, Sir, you may lie as honestly in these two beds as if you were in two chambers. With that he pulled a great curtain which drew across the room and effectually divided the beds. When we came to retire, he decently went out and then came to bed on his side of the room, 
but lay there talking to me a great while. At last, repeating his usual saying that he could lie naked in bed with me and not offer the least injury, he starts out of his bed. Now, my dear, you shall see how just I will be to you, and that I can keep my word. With that, he comes away to my bed. When he was there, he took me in his arms, and so I lay all night with him. He had no more to do with me other than embracing me. In the morning, he rose up and dressed, and left me as innocent for him as I was the day I was born. It was, to me, perfectly amazing. We came back to Bath. Although the familiarities between man and wife were common to us, he never offered to go any farther. I do not say that I was wholly pleased with it, as he thought I was, for I own I was much wickeder than he. We lived thus near two year, only with this exception. He went to London three times in that while. Once he stayed four months, but he always supplied me with money to subsist me very handsomely. I must own that the first breach was not on his part. One night we were in bed together, warm and merry, having drunk, I think, a little more wine than usual, when being clasped in his arms, I told him that I could find in my heart to discharge him of his engagement for one night and no more. After that there was no more resisting him, neither indeed had I any mind to. At length, as I had feared, I was indeed with child. I proposed trusting the secret to my landlady and asking her advice, which she agreed to. She undertook everything, engaged to procure a midwife and a nurse to satisfy all inquiries. She acquainted the parish officers that there was a lady ready to lie at her house, and that she knew her husband very well, and gave them, as she pretended, an account of his name, which she called Sir Walter Cleave. I lay in with as much credit as I should have done if I had really been my Lady Cleave. I was brought to bed of a fine boy. When he heard of it, he wrote me a very obliging letter, and told me he thought it would look better for me to come away for London as soon as I was up and well. I hired a coach, and taking my child, a wet nurse to tend and suckle it, and a maidservant with me, I went away for London. He met me at Reading in his own chariot, and brought me to my new lodgings, where I was well accommodated. When we were that night together, and gone such a length, I found the inclination was not to be resisted, but I was obliged to yield up all, even before he asked it. It is true he had no wife, that is to say, she was no wife to him, so I was in no danger that way. I lived six years in this happy but unhappy condition, in which time I brought him three children, but only the first of them lived. One morning I was surprised with a kind but melancholy letter from my gentleman, intimating that he was very ill and was afraid he should have another fit of sickness. His wife's relations being in the house with him, it would not be practical to have me there. I waited a fortnight or thereabouts, and heard nothing which surprised me. For the next fortnight I was near to distracted. I found that he was at a house in Bloomsbury, whither he had, a little before he fell sick, removed his whole family. One night I disguised myself as a maid and went to the door. I said I was sent to know how the master was. I found he had a pleurisy, attended with a cough and a fever. The doctors said there was very little hope for him, and that they did not expect he could live over the next night. I began to see an end to my prosperity. It lay very heavy upon my mind, too, that I had a son above five years old and no provision made for it. After a fortnight, I learnt in the neighbourhood that he was about the house, and then that he went abroad again. I waited near two months and heard nothing, but that he was gone into the country for the better recovery after his distemper. After yet two months more, I understood he was come to his city house again. Still, I heard nothing from him. 
I had written several letters for him representing my circumstances. Two or three of the letters had been called for, but not the rest. I found means to put a copy of the last letter into his own hands at a coffee house where I found he used to go. This letter forced an answer from him. Though I found I was to be abandoned, he had sent a letter to me some time before, desiring me to go to Bath again. My lover had been at the gates of death. With sad reflections upon his past life of gallantry and levity, he looked upon his former adultery, long and continued, with a just and religious abhorrence. Whenever sincere repentance succeeds such a crime as this, and the more the affection might seem to be before, the hatred will be the more in proportion. Though the good manners and justice in this gentleman kept him from carrying it on to any extreme, he writes me thus, Madam, I am surprised that my letter dated the 8th of the last month did not come to your hand. Having been at the edge of the grave, I am by the unexpected and undeserved mercy of heaven restored again. It cannot be strange to you that our unhappy affair has not been the least of the burdens which lay upon my conscience. I wish you would think of going back to Bath. I enclose you here a bill for fifty pounds for clearing yourself at your lodgings and carrying you down, and hope it will be no surprise to you to add that on this account only, and not for any offence given me on your side, I can see you no more. I will take due care of the child, leave him where he is, or take him with you, as you please. I am, etc. Now I was greatly perplexed about my little boy. It was death to me to part with a child. Yet when I considered being left with him to keep without a maintenance to support him, I resolved to leave him where he was. I concluded also to be near him myself, that I might have the satisfaction of seeing him without the care of providing for him. I sent my gentleman a short letter that I had obeyed his orders in all things but that of going back to Bath, which I could not think of for many reasons. I begged him he would put me in a posture to go back to my mother in Virginia, that if he would send me fifty pounds to facilitate my going away, I would send him back a general release and promised never to disturb him more with any importunities, unless it was to hear of the well-doing of the child, who, if I found my mother living and my circumstances able, I would send for him to come to me, and take him also effectually off his hands. This was indeed all a cheat thus far. I had no intention to go to Virginia, but the business was to get this last fifty pounds of him, if possible, knowing well enough it would be the last penny I was ever to expect. The argument I used of giving him a general release prevailed effectually with him. He sent me a bill for the money and release for me to sign, and though full saw against my will, a final end was put to this affair. I was now a single person again, and began to cast up my accounts. I had, by many letters and much importunity, and with the intercession of my mother, had a second return of some goods from my brother in Virginia, to make up the damage of the cargo I brought away with me. This too was upon the condition of my sealing a general release to him. However, I managed so well in this case, I got my goods away before the release was signed, and then I always found something or other to evade signing it at all. At length, I pretended I must write to my brother and have his answer before I could do it. I was now a loose, unguided creature, and had no help, no assistance, no guide for my conduct. I waited, lived with as much frugality as became my circumstances, but nothing presented, and the main stock wasted apace. The terror of approaching poverty lay hard upon my spirits. At length a new scene opened. There was in the house where I lodged a north country woman that went for a gentlewoman. 
Nothing was more frequent in her discourse than the cheapness of provisions and the easy way of living in her county, what good company they kept, and the like. London was an expensive and extravagant place, and I found that I could not live there under a hundred pound a year. She was always made to believe, as was everybody else, that I had at least three or four thousand pounds, if not more, all in my own hands. She was mighty sweet upon me when she thought me inclined in the least to go into her country. She said she had a sister lived near Liverpool, that her brother was a considerable gentleman there, and had a great estate also in Ireland. If I would give her my company thither, I should be as welcome as herself for a month or more as I pleased, till I should see how I liked the country. Accordingly, I packed up my baggage, though I did not absolutely know whither I was to go. One morning I decided to go to the bank, where I had found the clerk to whom I applied myself. I represented my case very plainly to him, and asked if he would be my adviser. He told me if I desired his opinion on anything within the reach of his business, he would do his endeavour that I should not be wronged. He said that he would also help me to a good, sober person, whose judgment was good, and whose honesty I might depend upon. He appointed the same evening after business was over for me to meet him and his friend. As soon as I saw his friend, and he but began to talk of the affair, I was fully satisfied I had a very honest man to deal with. He told me I might lodge the money in the bank as an account. If I was in the north, I might draw bills on the cashier and receive it when I would. I found at last he had a wife. But when he owned this, he said with some concern that indeed he had a wife and no wife. I began to think he had been in the condition of my late lover. However, we had not much more discourse at that time. He told me he was in too much hurry of business then, but that if I would come home to his house later, he would by that time consider what might be done for me. He said some very handsome and mannerly things in jest that would have pleased me very well if they had been in earnest. But that passed over. I took the directions and appointed to attend him at his house at seven o'clock the same evening. He made several proposals for placing my money in the bank in order to have interest on it. I found such a sincere, disinterested honesty in him that I began to muse with myself that I could never put myself in better hands. I assured him I had no heirs nor any relations in England, and would have neither heirs nor executors but himself, unless I should alter any condition before I died. I told him it should be all his own. He would deserve it by being faithful to me as I was satisfied he would be. He asked me how I came to have so much good will for him. Looking very much pleased, he said that he might very lawfully wish he was a single man for my sake. I smiled and told him that as he was not, my offer could have no design upon him in it. To be plain with you, madam, says he, I am a cuckold, and she is a whore. He went on to tell me all the circumstances of his case, particularly that having been out of England before he came to the post he was in, she had two children in the meantime by an officer of the army. When he came to England and, upon her submission, took her again and maintained her very well, she ran away from him with a linen draper's assistant, robbed him of what she could come at, and continued to live from him still. So, madam, says he, she is a whore, not by necessity, but of inclination. I came the next evening and brought my maid with me, to let him see that I kept a maid, but I sent her away as soon as I was gone in. I found, and I was not a little pleased with it, that he had provided a supper for me. I found also he lived very handsomely. After we had supped, he pressed me to drink two or three glasses of wine, which I declined, but drank one or two. He then told me he had a proposal to make to me, and assured me he had no dishonourable thing in his thoughts about me. His proposal was this, that I should sign and seal a contract with him, conditioning to marry him as soon as his divorce was obtained, and to be void if he could not obtain it. I played with this lover as an angler does with a trout. 
I found I had him fast on the hook. So I jested with his proposal and told him he knew little of me. I bade him inquire about me. I let him also go home with me to my lodging, though I would not ask him in, for I told him it was not decent. I ventured to avoid signing a contract of marriage, because the lady that had invited me so earnestly to go with her into Lancashire insisted so positively upon it, and promised me such great fortunes and fine things there, that I was tempted to go and try. However, I told him I would go into the north, and that he should know where to write to me by the consequence of the business I had entrusted with him. I gave him my word that as soon as he had sued out a divorce, I would come up to London, and then we would talk seriously of the matter. All the way to Lancashire, my friend caressed me with the utmost appearance of a sincere, undissembled affection, treated me, except for my coach hire, all the way. Her brother brought a gentleman's coach to Warrington to receive us, and we were carried from thence to Liverpool with as much ceremony as I could desire. Her uncle, as she called him, sent a coach and four horses for us, and we were carried nearly forty miles I know not whither. We came to a gentleman's seat, where was a numerous family, a large park, extraordinary company indeed, where she was called Cousin. I stayed there about six weeks. Then my friend led me back to a country village about six miles from Liverpool, where her brother, as she called him, came to visit me in his own chariot, with two footmen in good livery. The next thing was to make love to me. In all appearance, this brother was a match worth listening to. The least his estate was valued at was a thousand pounds a year, but his sister said it was worth fifteen hundred a year and lay most of it in Ireland. I was above being asked how much my estate was. My false friend, taking it upon a foolish hearsay, had raised it from five hundred to five thousand pounds. By the time we came into the country, she called it fifteen thousand. The Irishman courted me, made me presents, and ran in debt like a madman. He was tall, well-shaped, and talked as naturally of his park and stables, of his horses, gamekeepers, his woods, his tenants, his servants, as if we had been in the mansion house and I had seen them all about me. He assured me that when we came to Dublin, he would join to me in six hundred pound a year good land. This was such language as I had not been used to. I had now lost my power of saying no, and I consented to be married. I cannot say but I had some reflections in this affair upon the dishonourable forsaking my faithful citizen who loved me sincerely and was endeavouring to quit himself of a scandalous whore by whom he had indeed been barbarously used. The glittering show of a great estate which the deceived creature that was now my deceiver represented every hour to my imagination gave me no time to think of London, much less of the obligation I had to a person of infinitely more merit than what was now before me. After we had been married about a month, he began to talk of my going to Chester in order to embark for Ireland. We lodged not far from the cathedral. I forget what sign it was. Here, my spouse, talking of my going to Ireland, asked if I had no affairs to settle in London. I told him I knew not what he meant, and that I had no effects in the Bank of England that I knew of. I hoped he could never say that I had ever told him that I had. He said that I had not told him so, but his sister had said the greatest part of my estate lay there. I called his sister into my chamber the next morning and conjured her to tell me what she had said to him. She owned that she had told him that I was a great fortune. Did I ever tell you so? says I warmly. No, she said. It was true, I did not. My husband and her brother, as she called him, came into the room. I desired him to sit down. I am afraid, says I, my dear, for I spoke with kindness on his side, that you have had a very great abuse put upon you and an injury done you never to be repaired in your marrying me. He sat silent, so I went on. I asked you last night, said I, if ever I made boast to you of my estate in the Bank of England or anywhere else, 
and you owned that I had not. He said I had appeared always as a woman of fortune, and hoped he was not yet deceived. I fear you have been deceived, and I too, said I. But I am clearing myself from any unjust charge of being concerned in deceiving you. Pray, madam, said I, turning myself to his sister. Be so just to me before your brother to charge me if ever I pretended to you that I had an estate, and why, if I had, I should come down into this country with you on purpose to spare the little I had and live cheap. She could not deny one word, but said that she had been told in London that I had a very great fortune in the Bank of England. And now, dear sir, said I, be so just as to tell me who has abused both you and me. He pointed to her. After some pause, he flew out in the most furious passion that ever I saw a man in my life in, cursing her and calling her all the whores and hard names he could think of, declaring that she was to have five hundred pounds of him for procuring this match. He then added that she was none of his sister, but had been his whore for two years before, and that she had had one hundred pounds of him in part of this bargain, and that he was utterly undone if things were as I said. In his raving, he swore he would let her heart's blood out immediately, which frighted her, and me too. Turning to me again, he said very honestly that he was afraid we were both undone. To be plain, my dear, I have no estate, says he. What little I had, this devil has made me run out in waiting on you and putting me into this equipage. She took the opportunity of his talking with me to get out of the room, and I never saw her more. Why, says I to him, we are married here upon a double fraud. You are undone by the disappointment, it seems, and if I had a fortune, I had been cheated too, for you say you have nothing. You would indeed have been cheated, my dear, but not undone. Fifteen thousand pounds would have maintained us both very handsomely, and I assure you I had resolved to dedicate every groat of it to you. I would not have wronged you a shilling. The rest I would have made up in my affection to you and the tenderness of you as long as I lived. I really believe he spoke as he intended. I told him it was my unhappiness that what little I had was not able to relieve us a week. I pulled out a bank bill of twenty pounds and eleven guineas, which I told him I had saved out of my little income, and that by the account of living in that country that creature had given me, I expected it would maintain me three or four years. However, I told him if he would take it, there it was. He told me with great concern that he would not touch it. On the contrary, he had fifty guineas left, which was all he had in the world. He pulled it out and threw it down on the table, bidding me take it, though he were to starve for want of it. I returned that I could not bear to hear him talk so. On the contrary, if he could propose any probable method of living, I would do anything that became me on my part, and live as close and narrow as he could desire. Tell me plainly, my dear, says he, will the little you have keep us together in any figure or station or place? I resolved to conceal everything but the bank bill and the eleven guineas which I had owned, and would have been very glad to have lost that and have been set down where he took me up. I had indeed another bank bill about me of thirty pounds, which was the whole of what I had brought with me as well to subsist on in the country. This bill I concealed. We supped together and lay together that night. When we had almost supped, he looked a little better and more cheerful. He called for a bottle of wine. Come, my dear, says he. Though the case is bad, I will endeavour to find out some way or other to live. If you can but subsist yourself, that is better than nothing. Tis something of a relief, even to be undone by a man of honour, rather than by a scoundrel. We had a great deal of close conversation that night. We proposed a great many things, but nothing could offer. At last he took a husband's leave of me, and so we went to sleep. He rose before me in the morning, 
Indeed, I was very sleepy and lay till nearly eleven o'clock. In this time, he took his horses and three servants and all his linen and baggage, and away he went, leaving me a short but moving letter. My dear, I am a dog. I have abused you, but I have been drawn into it by a base creature, contrary to my principle and the general practice of my life. Forgive me, my dear. I ask your pardon with the greatest sincerity. I am now so wretched as to be forced to fly from you. If you can marry to your advantage, do not decline it on my account. I have put some of the stock of money I have left into your pocket. Take places for yourself and your maid in the stagecoach and go for London. Again, I sincerely ask your pardon and will as often as I think of you. Adieu, my dear, forever. I am yours most affectionately, J.E. I felt in my pocket, and there I found ten guineas, his gold watch, a small diamond ring worth about six pound, and a plain gold ring. I ate but little. After dinner I fell into a vehement fit of crying, every now and then calling him by his name. Come back, said I. Come back, I'll give you all I have. It was near dusk in the evening, being August, when to my unspeakable surprise, he comes back into the inn, but without a servant, and comes directly up into my chamber. It was impossible to conceal my joy, for I burst out into tears. He was no sooner in the room, but he ran to me and took me in his arms, holding me fast and stopping my breath with kisses. When our ecstasies were a little over, he told me he was gone about fifteen mile, but it was not in his power to go farther without coming back to see me again and to take his leave of me once more. I told him how loud I had called him to come back again. He said he heard me very plain upon Delamere Forest, about twelve miles off. I smiled. Nay, says he, do not think I am in jest. I heard you call me aloud. Sometimes I thought I saw you running after me. Why, said I, what did I say? For I had not named the words to him. You called aloud, says he, and said, Oh, Jamie, oh, Jamie, come back, come back. I then began to be amazed and surprised, and indeed frighted, and told him how I had called after him. He told me it would be a very difficult thing for him to leave me, but since it must be, he hoped I would make it as easy for him as I could. However, he told me that he had considered he had left me to travel to London alone, which was too long a journey, and that he was resolved to see me safe thither or near it. I agreed we would go together to London, but if he should go away at last, I would call him back again as loud as I did before. Then I pulled out his watch and gave it him back, and his two rings and his ten guineas. But he would not take them, which made me very much suspect that he was resolved to leave me. Two days after this we quitted Chester, I in the stagecoach, he on horseback. He came with me as far as Dunstable, and then told me fate and his own misfortunes obliged him to leave me. The stagecoach we were in did not usually stop at Dunstable, but they were content to stand at an inn door for a quarter of an hour, and we went into the house. In the inn I told him I had but one favour more to ask him, that he would give me leave to stay a week or two in the town with him, that we might think of something to prevent such a ruinous thing to us both as a final separation would be, and that I had something of moment to offer him which perhaps he might find practicable to our mutual advantage. This was too reasonable a proposal to be denied. He asked the landlady if she could not get us a lodging for two or three days in a private house, where I might rest me a little. The landlady, a good sort of woman, well-bred and very obliging, told me she had two or three good rooms in a part of the house quite out of the noise. We resolved to stay here a while. One evening I told him I would now make him the proposal I had talked of. I related how I had lived in Virginia, 
that I had a mother I believed was still alive there still, though my husband was dead some years. I told him that had not my effects miscarried, which, by the way, I magnified pretty much, I might have been fortune good enough to him to have kept us from being parted. I then gave him a full and direct account of the nature of planting, and told him what measures I would take to raise such a sum as three hundred pounds or thereabouts, and how we could put an end to our misfortunes and restore our circumstances in the world. He almost agreed to it, but still something or other broke it off again, till at last he began to talk almost to the same purpose of Ireland. I was dreadfully afraid upon such a proposal. He would have taken me at my word to sell my little income and let him carry it over into Ireland, but he anticipated me in that, for he added that he would go and try his fortune that way. He assured me that if he found nothing to be done in Ireland, he would then come to me and join in my project for Virginia. We parted at last with the utmost reluctance. The next day I came to London. I did not go directly to my old lodgings, but took a private lodging in St. John Street, near Clerkenwell. The pleasant hours I had with my last husband I looked back on with an infinite deal of pleasure. That pleasure was, however, much lessened when I found some time after that I was with child. I have taken care all this while to preserve a correspondence with my honest friend at the bank, or rather he took care to correspond with me. During my recess at St. John's I received a very obliging letter from him, assuring me that his process for a divorce from his wife went on with success, though he met with some difficulties in it that he did not expect. I was not displeased with this news. Though I was in no condition to have had him yet, I was not willing to lose him, for I saw apparently I should hear no more from my other husband. I now grew big. The people where I lodged intimated that I must think of removing. This put me to extreme perplexity, for indeed I knew not what course to take. I fell very ill. My melancholy really increased my distemper, my illness proved at length to be only an ague. Indeed, I would have been very glad to miscarry, but I could never be brought to entertain so much as a thought of endeavouring it. The mistress of the house sent for a midwife of the right sort for me. Every word this creature said was a cordial to me, and put new life and new spirit into my very heart. I told her my case was partly as she guessed, and partly not, for I was really married and had a husband, though he was so remote at that time and could not appear publicly. She told me that all the ladies that came under her care were married women to her, and whether the father was a husband or no husband was no business of hers. I understand, madam, says she, you have no security to prevent the parish impertinences usual in such cases. I have many ladies that come to my house to lie in, and have given security to the parish in general terms to secure them from whatever charge from whatsoever shall come into the world under my roof. I have but one question to ask in the whole affair. If that be answered, you shall be entirely easy with the rest. I told her that though I did not want for money so far as was necessary, I did not abound in it either. Well, madam, says she, that is the thing without which nothing can be done in these cases. Yet you shall see that I will not impose on you or offer anything that is unkind to you. She told me that she would bring an account of the expenses in two or three shapes, like a bill of fare. I looked upon the three bills and told her I did not see but that she was very reasonable in her demands, but I was sorry to tell her that I feared I must be her lowest rated customer. I found her an eminent lady in her way, and agreed to put myself into her hands. I'll see you are a little better looked after here than I think you are, says she, and it shall not cost you the more neither. As soon as I was well enough to go abroad, I went with a maid to see the house and the apartment I was to have. Everything was so handsome and clean, far beyond what I looked for. This 
grave matron in whose hands I was now fallen had several sorts of practice, and this one particular, that if a child was born, though not in her house, for she had occasion to be called to many private labours, she had people at hand who for a piece of money would take the child off their hands and off the parish too. She said she always took care that the children fell into good hands afterwards, and had no nurses in her business but what were very good, honest people. The only thing I found that gave me any distaste was that at the time when I expected to come with the child, I thought, she said, that she could give me something to make me miscarry. She put it off so cleverly I could not say she really intended it. While I was in her house, which was near four months, she had no less than twelve ladies of pleasure brought to bed within doors and I think she had two and thirty or thereabouts under her conduct without doors. Not a man was ever seen to come upstairs except to visit the lying-in ladies within their month, nor then without the old lady with them. Before I was brought to bed, I received a letter from the trustee of the bank full of kind and obliging things, earnestly pressing me to return to London. He concluded with telling me he had obtained a decree against his wife, and that he would be ready to make good his engagement to me if I would accept him. I returned an answer to this letter, and dated it at Liverpool, but sent it by a messenger, alleging that it came in cover to a friend in town, wishing him very well on whatever he resolved, without letting him into anything of my own mind, but mentioned, at a distance, my intention to return the latter end of the year. I was brought to bed about the middle of May, and had another brave boy. My governess, as she was called, did her part as midwife with the greatest art and dexterity imaginable. Her care of me in my travail, and after my lying in, was such that if she had been my own mother, it could not have been better. I received another letter from my friend at the bank, with the surprising news that he had obtained a final divorce against his wife who had been under some remorse before for her usage of him. As soon as she had the account that he had gained his point, she very unhappily destroyed herself that same evening. He expressed himself very handsomely as to his being concerned at her disaster, but cleared himself of having any hand in it. He pressed me very violently indeed to give him some hopes that I would at least come up to town and let him see me, I appeared melancholy and uneasy for several days, and my governess lay at me continually to know what troubled me. I could not tell her that I had an offer of marriage, after I had so often told her that I had a husband. She continued importuning me several days, but I told her it was impossible for me to commit the secret to anybody. However, she had so great a power of persuasion that there was no concealing anything from her. I resolved, therefore, to unbosom myself to her. She fell a-laughing at my scruples about marrying, and told me the other was no marriage, but a cheat on both sides and the obligation mutually destroyed. I was very free with my governess, who I had now learnt to call mother. I represented to her all the dark thoughts I had upon me about it, and told her what distress I was in. She touched me to the quick when she asked if I was sure that I was nursed by my own mother. On the contrary, I was sure I was not. I trembled and looked pale at the very expression. At last my governess came to me with her usual assurance. Come, my dear, says she. I have found out a way how you shall be at a certainty that your child shall be used well, and yet the people that take care of it shall never know you or who the mother is. The next week a countrywoman was brought from Hartford or thereabouts, who was to take the child off our hands entirely for ten pounds in money, but if I would allow five pounds a year more to her, she would be obliged to bring him to my governess's house as often as we desired, or we should come down and look at it and see how well she used it. The woman was very wholesome, a cottager's wife. With a heavy heart and many a tear, I let her have my child. Thus my great care was over. 
About the beginning of July, I sent my friend at the bank a letter that I purposed to be in town sometime in August. He returned me an answer in the most passionate terms imaginable, and desired me to let him have timely notice, and he would come and meet me. I took my leave, well satisfied to have been freed from such a house, however good my accommodations there had been. I took the place in the coach to Stone in Cheshire, and took passage again for London, sending a letter to my gentleman that I should be such a certain day at Stony Stratford, where the coachman told me he was to lodge. However, he met me at Brickhill the next morning, as we were just coming into the town. I confess I was very glad to see him. He took me out of the stagecoach immediately, and, putting into the same inn, he set up his own coach and bespoke his dinner. After dinner we walked to see the town, the church, and to view the fields. I observed my gentleman inquired pretty much about the parson. I took the hint immediately that he certainly would propose to be married. I was no sooner come back to the inn, but he fell upon me with irresistible words, that it would be hastening his felicity if I would put an end to the matter. With that he pulled out a great bundle of papers. Oh, don't be frightened, my dear, said he, and kissed me and laid them all abroad. He then took out a little chagrin case and gave me out of it a very fine diamond ring. I could not refuse it if I had a mind to do so, for he put it on my finger. I made him a curtsy and accepted it. Then he took out another ring. This, says he, is for another occasion, and puts it in his pocket holding me fast in his arms, but without the least offer of any indecency, he courted me to consent with such repeated entreaties and arguments, protesting his affection and vowing he would not let me go till I had promised him. I must not be denied. I won't be denied. I can't be denied. Well, well, said I, giving him a slight kiss. Then you shan't be denied. But uh, let me get up. He was so transported with my consent that I saw tears stand in his eyes. I turned from him, for it filled my eyes with tears too. I asked him leave to retire a little to my chamber. If ever I had a grain of true repentance for a vicious and abominable life for twenty-four years past, it was then. It occurred to me then what an abominable creature I am. And how is this innocent gentleman going to be abused by me. How little does he think that having divorced a whore, he is throwing himself into the arms of another, that he is going to marry one that has had three children by her own brother, one that was born in Newgate, whose mother was a whore and is now a transported thief, one that has lain with thirteen men and has had a child since he saw me. He was impatient for my coming out of my chamber, but finding me long, he went downstairs and talked with my landlord about the parson. When he comes upstairs, he tells me the minister is below and that he had talked with him. My landlord and his wife and daughter were called up, and we were married. We enjoyed ourselves that evening, yet all was kept so private in the inn that not a servant in the house knew of it. For all that, we had the bells set a-ringing the next morning early, and the music, such as the town could afford, under our window. Our landlord brazened it out that we were married before we came thither, only that being his former guests, we would have our wedding supper at his house. Having been disturbed by the bells, we were so sleepy afterwards that we lay in bed till almost twelve o'clock. My new spouse being below stairs, I had opened the window when I saw three gentlemen come by on horseback and go into the inn just against us. The second of the three was my Lancashire husband. I thought I should have sunk into the ground. I knew his clothes, I knew his horse, I knew his face. My next concern was to know, if possible, what was his business there. But that was impossible. Innumerable fancies came into my head. At last, hearing a great clutter in the passage of their inn, to my great satisfaction, I saw all three go out again 
and travel on westward. We resolved to be going the next day, but about six o'clock at night we were alarmed with a great uproar in the street. What was it but a hue and cry after three highwaymen that had robbed two coaches and some other travellers near Dunstable Hill? Notice had, it seems, been given that they had been seen at a house in Brick Hill. The house was immediately searched, but there were witnesses enough that the gentlemen had been gone above three hours. I presently told the people of the house that I durst to say that those were not the persons, for that I knew one of the gentlemen to be a very honest person and of good estate in Lancashire. My spouse was for travelling and told me it was always safest travelling after a robbery. I never lived four pleasanter days in my life. I was a mere bride all this while and my new spouse strove to make me entirely easy in everything. We came away the fifth day. My landlord, because he saw me uneasy, mounted himself and his son and three honest country fellows with firearms and, without telling us of it, followed the coach into Dunstable. I took possession at once of a house well furnished and a husband in very good circumstances. I lived with my husband in the utmost tranquillity. He was a quiet, sensible, sober man, virtuous, modest, sincere, and in his business diligent and just. We lived an uninterrupted course of ease and content for five years, when a sudden blow from an almost invisible hand blasted all my happiness. My husband, having trusted one of his fellow clerks with a sum of money too much for our fortunes to bear the loss of, the clerk failed, and the loss fell very heavy on my husband. He grew melancholy, disconsolate, and from thence lethargic, and died. I foresaw the blow, and was extremely oppressed in my mind, for I saw evidently that if he died, I was undone. I had had two children by him, and no more, for it began to be time for me to leave bearing children. Though I was not in debt, I could easily foresee that what was left would not support me long. For a little relief, I had put off my house and took lodgings, and sold off most of my goods, which put a little money in my pocket. I lived near a year upon that, eking things out to the utmost. One evening, when being brought, as I may say, to the last gasp, I passed by an apothecary's shop in Leadenhall Street, where I saw a little bundle wrapped in white cloth. I remember and I shall never forget it. It was like a voice spoken to me over my shoulder. Take the bundle. Be quick. Do it this moment. It was no sooner said, but I stepped into the shop. With my back to the wench, I put my hand behind me and took the bundle. I crossed the street and went down the first turning I came to. The farther I was out of danger, the faster I went. When I reached my lodgings, I came to open the bundle. I found there was a suit of childbed linen in it, very good and almost new, a silver porringer, a small silver mug and silver spoons, some other linen, a good smock, three silk handkerchiefs, and eighteen shillings and sixpence in money. I was in such terror of mind, though perfectly safe, that I sat down and cried. What am I now? I said. A thief. Next time I shall be carried to Newgate and tried for my life. My own distress hardened my heart by degrees. I went out now by daylight. My prompter, like a true devil, set me upon a pretty little child. I prattled to it, and in the dark of the alley I stooped, pretending to mend the child's clog that was loose, took off her necklace, and so led the child on again. Then I turned her about and bade it go home. The string of beads was worth about twelve or fourteen pounds. However, I did the child no harm. I did not so much as fright it. Another adventure I had was very lucky to me. A fellow running by me swift as lightning throws a bundle that was in his hand just behind me. God bless you, missus. Let it lie there a while. Away he runs swift as the wind. After him comes two more, and immediately a young fellow crying, Stop, thief! After him came two more. I stood stock still till they came back, dragging the poor fellow and lugging the things they had found, 
extremely well satisfied that they had recovered the booty. After the crowd was fully passed, I took my opportunity to turn about and take up what was behind me and walk away. I got safe to my lodgings with this cargo, some black lustring silk and about eleven yards of velvet. I made several adventures more, though but with small purchase, yet with good success. I went in daily dread that some mischief would befall me, and that I should certainly be hanged at last. I walked frequently out into the villages around town. Going by a house near Stepney, I saw on the window board two rings, one small diamond ring, the other plain gold, to be sure laid there by some thoughtless lady, perhaps only till she washed her hands. I walked several times by the window, but could see nobody in the room. Seeing the coast clear, I thrust hard against the square of glass and broke it with very little noise, took out the two rings, and walked away with them very safe. I was now at a loss for the market of my goods, but was loath to dispose of them for a trifle. I now made a visit to my old governess and found she drove something of the old trade still, but that she was not in such flourishing circumstances as before. Her house was but meanly furnished, but she was a stirring, bustling woman and some stock left, and was turned pawnbroker, and lived pretty well. She received me very civilly. I told her I had not much money left, but had some things that were money's worth, if she could tell me how I might turn them into money. I showed her the things. She told me that she would sell them for me as pawned to her. I would gladly have turned my hand to any honest employment if I could have got it. Here she was deficient. Honest business did not come within her reach. Had I been younger, perhaps she might have helped me to spark, but my thoughts were off that kind of livelihood as being quite out of the way after fifty, which was my case. She invited me at last to be at her house till I could find something to do, and it should cost me very little. I entered into some measures to have my little son by my last husband taken off. This she made easy too, reserving a payment of only five pounds a year. At last I got some quilting work for ladies' beds, petticoats and the like. I worked very hard, and with this I began to live but the diligent devil resolved I should continue in his service. One evening I blindly obeyed his summons, but met with no purchase. I came home very weary and empty. Not content with that, I went out the next evening, when, going by an alehouse, I saw the door of a little room open, and on the table a silver tankard. When I had been at home some time, I told my governess the whole story of the tankard, since she was turned pawnbroker, my governess had a sort of people about her that were none of the honest ones I had met there before. I found that in following this trade, she always melted down the plate she bought. One morning she told me that she was going to melt, and if I would, she would put my tankard in. She weighed it and allowed me the full value in silver. I told my governess I had little work and nothing to live on. Says she... I could help you to a schoolmistress that shall make you as dexterous as herself. The comrade she helped me to dealt in stealing of shop books and pocket books, and taking off gold watches from ladies' sides. This she did so well that no other woman ever arrived to the perfection of it. My new partner in wickedness and I went on together so long without being detected that we not only grew bold, we grew rich and had at one time one and twenty gold watches in our hands. As poverty brought me into the mire, so avarice kept me in, till there was no going back. My teacher, with another of her scholars, made an attempt upon a linen draper in Cheapside, but was snapped by a hawk-eyed journeyman and seized with two pieces of cambric upon them. This was enough to lodge them both in Newgate where they were both condemned to die. They both pleaded their bellies. Both were voted quick with child, though my tutoress was no more with child than I was. I went frequently to condole with them. The place gave me so much horror, 
reflecting that it was the place of my unhappy birth and of my mother's misfortune, that I was forced to leave off going to see them. My comrade, having the brand of an old offender, was executed. The young offender was spared. I began now to be very wary. Having narrowly escaped a particular scouring, I began to think I must give over the trade in earnest. However, my governess was not willing to lose me. A prize presented, which, as it came by her management, she expected a good share of the booty. I had a good account from her where was lodged a quantity of Flanders lace, which was then prohibited. I went to a customs house officer and told him I could go directly to the place. The hole being very dark, I squeezed myself in and so reached the pieces out to him, taking care to secure as much about myself as I could conveniently dispose of. There was near three hundred pounds worth of lace, and I secured about fifty pounds of it to myself. I left the officer overjoyed with his prize. He offered me fifty pounds as my share. I consented, only demanding a piece of lace which I thought came to about eight or nine pounds, as if it had been for my own wear. I very punctually divided this spoil with my governess. I was now too well known among the trade. Some of them began to be angry that I should escape when they were always catched and hurried to Newgate. My governess laid a new contrivance for my going abroad. This was to dress me up in men's clothes, and so put me into a new kind of practice. However, I seldom went abroad but in the night. She joined me with a young fellow who was nimble enough at his business. For about three weeks we did very well together. We grew very intimate, but it was absolutely necessary, as appeared afterwards to me, to conceal my sex from him. There was a shop in a certain street which had a warehouse behind it that looked into another street. Through the window of the warehouse we saw lying on the counter five pieces of silks, besides other stuffs. This young fellow could not restrain himself and ran rashly upon it, slipped out a square of the sash window dexterously enough, without noise, and got out four pieces of the silks and came with them towards me. He was immediately pursued with a terrible clutter and noise. He ran like lightning, and I too, but the pursuit was hotter after him because he had the goods. He dropped two of the pieces, which stopped them a little, but they took him soon after with the other two pieces upon him, and then the rest followed me. I ran for it, and got to my governess's house, whither some quick-eyed people followed me so warmly as to fix me there. My governess told them they should very freely search her house, if they would bring a constable. When they came to my door, I bade her open it. There I sat at work with a great litter of things about me, as if I had been at work all day. When they had searched the house from bottom to top, and then from top to bottom, and could find nothing, they carried my governess before the justice. He satisfied himself with giving her an oath that she had not received or admitted any man in our house to conceal him, or protect him, or hide him from justice. This oath she might justly take, so she was dismissed. My poor partner in this mischief was committed to Newgate, but got his indictment deferred upon promise to discover his accomplices. He gave my name, who he called Gabriel Spencer. Here appeared the wisdom of my concealing my name and sex from him. I was terribly uneasy all this while, and took the stagecoach to Dunstable to my old landlord and landlady. Here I told a formal story that I expected my husband every day from Ireland. My landlady was mighty glad to see me. I stayed here five weeks, but when my governess at last sent me the joyful news that my partner was hanged, I came merry enough to London. My governess told me she would never recommend any partner to me again. I had indeed one comrade whose fate went very near me for a good while. That case was indeed very unhappy. I had made a prize of a piece of very good damask in a mercer's shop. When we went out of the shop, I conveyed the piece to this companion of mine and went clear off myself. They presently seized her with the damask. I very luckily stepped into a house where there was a lace chamber, and had the terror of seeing the poor creature dragged away and immediately committed to Newgate. I came away 
very sad-hearted indeed for the poor woman who was in tribulation for what I had stolen. My name was public among these people as Mull Flanders, but how to find me out they knew not. The jury brought her in guilty, but the court, considering she really was not the person who stole the goods, allowed her to be transported, unless in the meantime she could find me out, and they could hang me. They would intercede for her pardon. I took care to make it impossible to her. I was easy at her transportation, because she was then out of the way of doing me any mischief. During this interval, I confined myself pretty much at home, but finding the fund fail, I began to think of my old trade again. I dressed myself like a beggar woman in the coarsest rags I could get and walked about, peering and peeping into every door and window I came near. I had been bred up tight and cleanly and naturally abhorred dirt, so this was the most uneasy disguise for me. I wandered about all the evening the first time I went out and made nothing of it. At length I met a woman and closed with her. We drove on our business pretty well. I was two or three times in a house where we saw a quantity of prohibited goods. My companion once brought away three pieces of Dutch black silk that turned to good account. I had my share of it, but in all the journeys I made by myself I could not get an opportunity to do anything. The next day I dressed myself up fine and took a walk to the other end of town. I saw a great clutter in the place, and who should it be but some great duchess coming into the exchange? They said the Queen was coming. Keeping my eye upon a parcel of lace which the shopkeeper was showing to some ladies that stood by me, I found means to slip a paper of lace into my pocket. Mingling myself with the crowd, I went out at the other door of the exchange and got away before they missed their lace. I called a coach and shut myself in it. The milliner's maid and five or six more came running up the street, and I could hear the words, Robbed! Lace! two or three times, and saw the wench wringing her hands. The coachman was getting up into the box, but the horses had not begun to move. I was terribly uneasy, and took the packet of lace and laid it ready to have dropped it out at the flap of the coach. But in less than a minute the coach began to move, and I brought off my purchase which was worth near twenty pound. On the Christmas day following, in the evening, I went abroad to see what might offer in my way. Going by a working silversmith's in Foster Lane, I saw a great deal of loose plate in the window and at the seat of the man who usually, as I suppose, worked at one side of the shop. I went boldly in and was just going to lay my hand upon a piece of plate and might have done it and carried it clear off. But an officious fellow seizes upon me and cries out for the people of the house. I had not touched anything in the shop. Seeing a glimpse of somebody running over to the shop, I had so much presence of mind as to knock very hard with my foot on the floor of the house and was just calling out too when the fellow laid hands on me. I stood very high on it that I came in to buy half a dozen of silver spoons. To my good fortune, it was a silversmith that sold plate as well as worked it for other shops. The fellow would have it that I came not to buy but to steal. I said that he must prove it, and I desired to go before a magistrate. After a full hearing, I was dismissed. It was but three days after this that I ventured into a house where I saw the doors open, and furnished myself, as I thought, verily, without being perceived, with two pieces of brocaded silk. I was attacked by two wenches that came open-mouthed at me just as I was going out the door. One of them pulled me back into the room. They tore my clothes, bullied and roared as if they would have murdered me. The mistress of the house came next, then the master, all outrageous for a while especially. I told the master the door was open and things were a temptation to me. I said that I was poor and distressed and poverty was what many could not resist. I begged him with tears to have pity on me. The mistress of the house was moved with compassion and had almost persuaded her husband to it also, 
but the saucy wenches were run even before they were sent and had fetched a constable. Then the master said he could not go back. I must go before a justice, and, answered his wife, that he might come into trouble himself if he should let me go. The woman argued again for me, seeing they had lost nothing, to let me go. I offered to pay for the two pieces whatever the value was. It would be cruel to pursue me to death for the bare attempt of taking them. When I came to the justice and pleaded that I had neither broken anything to get in nor carried anything out, the justice was inclined to release me. But the first saucy jade that stopped me affirmed that I was going out with the goods, but that she stopped me and pulled me back as I was on the threshold. Upon that point the justice committed me, and I was carried to Newgate, the place that had so long expected me, and which I had so long avoided. Nothing was more odious to me than the company that was there. The night that I was sent to Newgate, I sent the news of it to my old governess, who spent the night almost as ill out of Newgate as I was in it. The next morning she came to see me and did what she could to comfort me. She applied to the man whose goods had been stolen, and particularly his wife. The man alleged he was bound by the justice that committed me to prosecute, and that he should forfeit his recognizance. I thought of nothing night and day but gibbets and halters, evil spirits and devils, and was harassed between the dreadful apprehensions of death and the terror of my conscience reproaching me with my past horrible life. I know not how it was, but by the indefatigable application of my diligent governess, I had no bill preferred against me by the first sessions. So I had another month or five weeks before me. My last forty years had been a horrid complication of wickedness, whoredom, adultery, incest, lying, theft, everything but murder and treason from the age of eighteen. The horrors of the place were become familiar. I felt no more uneasiness at the noise and clamour of the prison than they did who made that noise. In a word, I was become a Newgate bird, as wicked and outrageous as any of them. They told me one night there was brought into the prison three highwaymen who had committed a robbery somewhere on the road to Windsor, Hounslow Heath, I think it was. It is not to be wondered at that we prisoners were all desirous enough to see these brave, topping gentlemen, especially because it was said they in the morning be removed into the press yard to be allowed the liberty of that better part of the prison. Nothing could express the amazement and surprise I was in when the very first man that came out I knew to be my Lancashire husband. The same I afterwards saw at Brickhill when I was married to my last husband. I was struck dumb at the sight. He did not know me, and that was all the present relief I had. This gentleman's misfortunes I placed all to my own account. Though I never told him that I was a fortune, I did not actually deceive him myself, yet I did encourage the having it thought that I was so. By that means, I was the occasion originally of his mischief. While I was under the influences of sorrow for him, came notice to me that the next sessions approaching, I should certainly be tried for my life at the Old Bailey. I sent for my old governess. She left no stone unturned to prevent the grand jury finding the bill. But all would not do. They were overruled by the rest. The wenches swore home to the fact and the jury found the bill against me for felony and burglary. It was the discourse all over the house that I should die for it. At last one of the keepers came to me privately and said with a sigh, Well, Mrs. Flanders, you will be tried on Friday. I doubt you will find but little mercy and would have you prepare for death. Unless you have very good friends, you are no woman for this world. My poor afflicted governess believed there was a curse from heaven upon her that she should be damned and that she had brought ten or eleven people to the gallows. 
on the Friday I was brought to my trial. I pleaded that I had stole nothing, they had lost nothing, that the door was open, and I went in seeing the goods lie there with a design to buy. The court would not allow that by any means. I was found guilty of felony, but acquitted of burglary, which was but small comfort to me. The first bringing me to a sentence of death, and the last would have done no more. The next day I was carried down to receive the dreadful sentence. I told them I had much to say to bespeak the mercy of the court. The judges gave me an easy hearing, and time to say all that I would, but pronounced the sentence of death upon me. My poor governess wanted comfort now herself. I expected nothing but to find my name in the dead warrant, which was to come down for the execution the Friday afterward of five more and myself. I hid nothing from the minister who came to me. He, in return, exhorted me to a sincere repentance, then drew out such a scheme of infinite mercy that he left me nothing to say that looked like despair. In this condition he left me the first night. It was no less than twelve days after our receiving sentence before any were ordered for execution. I found my name was among them. I swooned away twice, but spoke not a word. The good minister was sorely afflicted for me, and did what he could to comfort me. I wondered much that I did not see him all the next day, it being the day before the time appointed for execution. My heart leapt for joy when I heard his voice at the door, even before I saw him. After having made a short excuse for his not coming, he told me, that he had brought me a reprieve. The next morning, the first thing I was saluted with was the tolling of the great bell of St. Sepulchre's, which ushered in the day. A dismal groaning and crying was heard from the condemned hole, where there lay six poor souls who were to be executed that day. This was followed by a confused clamour for the poor creatures that were to die. Some cried, some huzzahed and wished them a good journey, some damned and cursed those that had brought them to it, and some few, but very few, praying for them. All the while the poor condemned creatures were preparing to their death, I was seized with a fit of trembling, as much as if I had been in the same condition. As soon as they were all put into the carts and gone, which, however, I had not the courage enough to see, I fell into a fit of crying involuntarily, nor could I stop or put a check to it. About a fortnight after this, I had some just apprehensions that I should be included in the next dead warrant at the ensuing sessions, and it was not without great difficulty and at last an humble petition for transportation that I avoided it. I had now a certainty of life indeed, but with the hard conditions of being ordered for transportation. My governess, who had during most of this part been dangerously sick, in as near a view of death by her disease as I was by my sentence, was now recovering and just able to come abroad to see me. I lay in the prison near fifteen weeks after this order for transportation was signed. At the end of this time I was put on board a ship in the Thames, and with me a gang of thirteen as hardened, vile creatures as ever Newgate produced in my time. I took this opportunity to satisfy my curiosity over my Lancashire husband, pretending I had been robbed in the Dunstable coach. Immediately it was rumoured all over the prison that Moll Flanders would turn evidence against one of the highwaymen, and that I was to come off by it from the sentence of transportation. My husband desired to see this Mrs. Flanders that knew him so well, and was to be an evidence against him. Accordingly, I had leave given to go to him. He said little to me at first, but I asked if I might not be admitted to talk with him alone. As soon as the keeper was gone, I threw off my hood, and bursting into tears, My dear, says I, do you not know me? 
He turned pale and speechless. After a time, he cast up his eyes. How could you be so cruel to come to me in such a place as this? Is it not to insult me? I have not robbed you, at least not on the highway. I told him in a few words that I was far from coming to insult him, but to condole mutually. How is that possible, says he, when I expect to be cast for my life the very next sessions? It is very possible when I shall tell you that I have been cast so three sessions ago and am under the sentence of death. He listened most attentively to all my story. Was it you, my dear, says he, that gave the check to the mob that was at our heels at Brick Hill? Why then, it was you that saved my life at that time. I will pay the debt to you now and deliver you from the present condition you are in, or I will die in the attempt. I then inquired into the circumstances of his present case. He said that if nobody came in against him, he hoped he should be cleared, that he had had some intimation that if he would submit to transport himself, he might be admitted to it without a trial. We parted after this conference with such testimonies of kindness and affection as I thought were equal, if not superior, to that at our parting at Dunstable. In the month of February, I was with seven other convicts delivered to a merchant that traded to Virginia. We were that night clapped under hatches and kept so close I thought I should have suffocated for want of air. The next morning we had the liberty to come upon the deck. I asked one of the officers whether I might send a letter on shore to let my friends know where the ship lay. He very honestly had my letter delivered to my governess and brought back an answer from her in writing. In the meantime, my governess, faithful to the last moment, conveyed my letter to the prison and to my husband. The next day she brought with her a sea chest filled with everything almost that I could want. In one of the corners of the chest was a private drawer where was my bank of money, including a sea bed. I read a long lecture to her of what I proposed to do. She soon agreed cheerfully to my going and made it her business from that time to get my husband out of prison in time so that he might go in the same ship with me. This was at last brought to pass, but with great difficulty. As we were both on board, actually bound for Virginia, I for five years and he under bonds and security not to return to England any more as long as he lived, he was very much dejected and cast down. It was true that he was not ordered to be sold when he came to Virginia, as we were. For that reason he was obliged to pay for his passage, which we were not. He took me in his arms. My dear, says he, you have twice saved my life. From henceforward it shall be all employed for you, and I'll always take your advice. The ship now began to fill. Several passengers came on board who were embarked on no criminal account. These had accommodation assigned to them in the great cabin and other parts of the ship. When my husband came on board, I spoke to the boatswain, who had given me hints of his friendship in carrying my letter to my husband. I told him he had befriended me in so many things, and I had not made any suitable return to him. My governess waited upon the captain and told him she hoped that ways might be found for her two unfortunate cousins, as she called us, to obtain our freedom when we came to Virginia. She let him know that we were not unfurnished to set ourselves to work in the country and were resolved to live there as planters. The captain readily offered his assistance and told her thus, Madam, your cousins, in the first place, must procure somebody to buy them as servants in conformity to the conditions of their transportation. Then, in the name of that person, they may go about what they will. They may either purchase some plantations already begun, or purchase land of the government of the country and begin where they please. We sailed on the 10th of April, nor did we touch any more at any place till being driven on the coast of Ireland by a very hard gale, the ship came to anchor in a little bay. I was never so sorrowful at parting with my own mother as I was at parting with my governess. 
and I never saw her more. The captain, who continued the same kind, good-humoured man as at first, took us two on shore with him. He did it in kindness to my husband, who bore the sea most ill and was very sick, especially when it blew so hard. We set sail again, and in two and forty days came safe to the coast of Virginia. When we drew near to the shore, the captain told me that he found by my discourse I had some relations in the place and that I had been there before. He supposed, therefore, that I understood the custom in their disposing the convict prisoners when they arrived. I told him I did not, and he might be sure I would make myself known to none of them while I was a prisoner. As to the rest, I told him we should do as he should direct. He brought a planter to treat with him, as it were, for the purchase of these two servants, my husband and me. We were formerly sold to this man and went ashore with him. The captain went with us and carried us to a certain house where we had a bowl of punch. After some time, the planter gave us a certificate of discharge and an acknowledgement of having served him faithfully. We were free from him the next morning to go whither we would. For this piece of service, the captain demanded of us a certain weight of tobacco which he said he was accountable for, for his freighter. We made him a present of twenty guineas besides, with which he was abundantly satisfied. The first thing I did, after having gotten all our goods on shore, and placed them in a storehouse, which with a lodging we hired when we landed, was to inquire after my mother and brother. I found that my mother was dead, and that my brother was alive, which I confess I was not very glad to hear. I found he was removed from the plantation where I lived with him formerly, and was now with one of his sons in a plantation just by the place where we had landed. I had a great mind to see him, if it was possible, to do so without his seeing me. With a woman of the place who I got to help me, I rambled about and asked her whose plantation that was. There says she, is the gentleman that owns the place, and his father with him. The man's name is Humphrey. I believe the father's is too. You may guess what a confused mixture of joy and fright possessed my thoughts upon this occasion, for I immediately knew that this was nobody else but my own son, by that father she showed me, who was my own brother. The old gentleman was grown dim-sighted by some distemper which had fallen upon his eyes. I threw open my hoods and let them pass by me. It was a wretched thing for a mother thus to see her own son, a handsome, comely gentleman in flourishing circumstances. When he went from me, I stood gazing and trembling, and kissed the ground he had set foot on. I proposed to my husband our going away, and carrying all our effects with us to Carolina, where we resolved to settle. My husband readily agreed that it was not at all proper to stay where we were, since I had assured him we should become known there. The rest I effectually concealed from him. However, I could not think of going out of the country without somehow or other making inquiry into the grand affair of what my mother had done for me nor could I bear the thought of not making myself known to my old husband or to my child. Only I would fain have had this done without my new husband having any knowledge of it, or they having any knowledge that I had such a thing as a husband. I had such strong impressions on my mind about discovering myself to my brother, formerly my husband, that I could not withstand them. It ran constantly in my thoughts that if I did not do it while he lived, I might in vain endeavour to convince my son afterwards that I was really his mother, and so might lose the assistance and comfort of the relation and the benefit of whatever it was my mother had left me. On the other hand, I could never think it proper to discover myself to them in the circumstances I was in. On both accounts, it was absolutely necessary for me to remove from the place where I was and come again to him as from another place and in another figure. I told my husband in general, too, that as I had several relations in the place where we were, and that I durst not now let myself be known to them, 
because they would soon come into a knowledge of the occasion and reason of my coming over. I had reason to believe that my mother, who died here, had left me something, perhaps considerable, which it might be very worth my while to inquire after. In a very little while, on the other side of the bay in Maryland, there was a ship which came from Carolina and was going back again thither. On this news, we hired a sloop to take our goods, and taking a final farewell of Potomac River, we went with all our cargo over to Maryland. I resolved to write a letter to my brother first, to let him know who I was, and that I was not come to give him any trouble upon the old relation, which I hoped was entirely forgot. I said some very tender, kind things in the letter about his son, which I told him he knew to be my own child, so I hoped he would allow me the most passionate desire of seeing him once more. I did believe that having received this letter, he would give it to his son to read. But it fell out better than this, for as his sight was so dim, he had allowed his son to open all letters that came to his hand for him. My son asked the messenger where the person was who gave him the letter. The messenger told him the place, which was about seven miles off. Ordering a horse to be got ready and two servants, away he came to me with the messenger. I was perfectly confounded, for I knew not whether it was peace or war. However, I had but a very few moments to think, for my son comes directly up to me, kisses me, took me in his arms and embraced me with so much passion that he could not speak, but I could feel his breast heave and throb like a child that sobs but cannot cry it out. We cried over one another a considerable time, when at last he broke out first, My dear mother, I never expected to see your face. He told me that what his grandmother left me was in his hands, and that he would do me justice to my full satisfaction. As to his father, he was old and infirm both in body and mind, almost blind and capable of nothing. I told him I was on the Maryland side of the bay, at the plantation of a particular friend who came from England in the same ship with me. He told me I should go home and live with him, if I pleased, as long as I lived. I said that I should be glad to be as near him as possible, yet I could not think of being in the house, where I should also be under constant restraint, for fear of betraying myself in my discourse. He took me to a plantation next to his own, where I was as well entertained as I could have been in his own. Having first called me his aunt, and given a charge to the people, who it seems were his tenants, to treat me with all possible respect, he went away home. About two hours after he was gone, he sent a maid-servant and a negro boy to wait on me, and provisions ready dressed for my supper. I began now secretly to wish that I had not brought my Lancashire husband from England at all. However, I loved him entirely, as indeed I had ever done from the beginning. The next morning my son came to visit me again almost as soon as I was up. He first of all pulled out a deerskin bag and gave it me, with five and fifty Spanish pistoles in it. Then he pulled out his grandmother's will, whereby it appeared that she had left me a small plantation on York River, with a stock of servants and cattle, and given it into trust to this son of mine for my use, and to my heirs if I had any children. This plantation, though remote from him, he said he did not let out, but managed it by a steward as he did another that was his father's, and went over three or four times a year to look after it. He said that if I would let it out, he would give me sixty pounds a year for it, but if I would let him be my steward, he would manage it for me as he had done for himself, and he believed he should be able to send me as much tobacco to England from it as would yield me about a hundred pounds a year, sometimes more. My son's tender carriage and kind offers fetched tears from me. I told him I had no child but him in the world, and now was past having any. If I should marry, 
I would desire him to get a writing drawn, which I was ready to execute, by which I would after me give it wholly to him and his heirs. My son came every day after this, and spent a great part of his time with me, and carried me about to several of his friends' houses where I was entertained with great respect. I made him one present. It was all I had of value, and that was one of the two gold watches I had in my chest. I desired he would now and then kiss it for my sake. I stayed here above five weeks, and indeed had much ado to get away then. I brought over with me, for the use of our plantation, three horses with harnesses and saddles, some hogs, two cows, and a thousand other things, the gift of the kindest and tenderest child that ever woman had. I related to my husband all the particulars of the voyage, except that I had called my son my cousin. I told him my mother had left me such a plantation, and that I had left it to my cousin's management. Then I pulled him out the hundred pound in silver as the first year's produce, and the deerskin purse with the pistoles. Then I let him know what I had brought over in the sloop, which added to his surprise and filled his heart with thankfulness. From this time forward, I believe he was as sincere a penitent and as thoroughly reformed man as ever God's goodness brought back from a profligate, a highwayman, and a robber. We had a very good success. We enlarged our number of servants, built us a very good house, and cured every year a great deal of land. In a word, we were now in very considerable circumstances for our new plantation grew upon our hands insensibly. After I had been a year at home again, I went across the bay to see my son. I was surprised that my old husband was dead and had not been buried above a fortnight. This, I confess, was not disagreeable news, so I told my son before I came from him that I believed I should marry a gentleman who had a plantation near mine. My son the same kind, dutiful, and obliging creature as ever, treated me now at his own house, paid me my hundred pound, and sent me home again loaded with presents. Some time after this, I let my son know I was married, and invited him over to see us. My husband wrote a very obliging letter to him also, inviting him to come and see him. He came accordingly some months after, just when my cargo from England arrived, which I let him believe belonged all to my husband's estate, not to me. When my brother was dead, I freely gave my husband an account of all that affair, and of this cousin being my son. He was perfectly easy in the account, for he said that it was no fault of mine, nor my brother's. Thus, all the little difficulties were made easy, we lived together with the greatest kindness and comfort imaginable. I am come back to England, being almost seventy years of age, my husband sixty-eight, having performed much more than the limited terms of my transportation. Now, notwithstanding all the fatigues and all the miseries we have gone through, we are both in good heart and health. My husband remained in Maryland some time after me to settle our affairs, but is coming over to England also, where we resolve to spend the remainder of our years in sincere penitence for the wicked lives we have lived.